Hey, Michael, how you doing today? Hi, I'm good. How are you? I'm feeling pretty good. Uh, what are we down to? Five more. Oh, I don't know. How many? Five more episodes. Really? Yes, five sad, more isn't episodes, it? man. Uh, it's very sad. I'd like to say that it went fast, but it didn't. No, it didn't go fast. <laughs> Did not go fast, that's I'd like for sure. to say it was gone in a blink of an eye, but it fucking wasn't. No, it was not. That's uh, okay, we, though. We've got a great guest. You know, uh, you know what we've done. I'm sure people know, but the last nine episodes, we're bringing back some of our favorite guests that were with us earlier on in the podcast. Today, we have a great one, one of the fans' favorites, uh, one of the most uh, interesting and talented writers and producers in the business. If you don't know his story, listen to episode 18 of Talking Sopranos, and it is a fascinating story. Uh, he has written and produced episodes for over 30 different TV series, including Final Boardwalk Empire, Brooklyn Rules, nominated for 14 Emmys, Michael, winning four, including one for writing Pine Barrens, a lot of people's uh, favorite episode in the entire 86. He was nominated for an Academy Award, for writing The Wolf of Wall Street, his wife, Rachel, was also nominated that same year for a, a, for Academy Award. Uh, he wrote 25 episodes of The Sopranos, produced many others, acted in three episodes, including my first one. I told you that story. That's right. And he directed one episode in the final season. Please welcome our friend, Mr. Terry Winter. Hey, guys. Hey, there you are. so much for that uh, wonderful introduction. You know, the last time I did the show, I, I felt bad because I didn't have my own curtain. You guys have such a great curtain behind you. I went out and got you know, my yeah. own nice backdrop it's here. Nice one. And it's good. That it looked, is beautiful. Yeah, I, I took, believe me, it took me a while to pick it out. I wasn't sure what I wanted to go with, but I decided something simple but tasteful. You know, <laughs> that would be good. I like it. Did Thank you? Uh, uh, have an interior designer. Uh, I did. Up. It turned out the guy killed uh, sixteen Czechoslovakians. Uh, oh, so we had to we had to get rid of them. But I, no, seriously, I, I'm I, I'm coming to you from a, a hotel room, as as you guys know, uh, in Vegas. Enough said. Uh, exactly. So what we want to talk to you about the last season, which we still call season seven. Yeah. Uh, HBO called it six. Me. Bullshit. <laughs> For whatever bullshit reason that was, we still don't really know. Sure it always comes down money, to money, doesn't it? That's it. That's yeah. it. Does. So, it does. Uh, you know, going into the last, to the seventh season, you, you know, we, uh, you know, we talked about we were sad. You know, we, yeah. you know, it started to hit us. It took a while, mm -hmm. but, you know, it started hitting. This is the last time we're going to shoot here and shoot here and work right. with this guy and that guy and this girl. Did you, going into the final season, did, how was it different writing for these last uh, nine episodes? Did you have that prepared earlier? Did it just come about? How did that go down? Uh, if I remember correctly, it it, it uh, was like any other season. Uh, and, and we wish just to say, like, by the end of a season, we'd say, right, well, why don't we jump on next year and start coming up with storylines? This way we can hit the ground running when we come back and couple of months and of course we never do that uh you have all these grandiose plans of how you're going to keep ahead and you know uh you know get things done quicker and it, it, you know unfortunately i think or, or it's just part of the process until you're actually in the room and it's for keeps you don't really you know you have a couple of notions about things uh you know so i think we just sort of sat down like any other season and said all right what are we going to do now of course knowing that you know you're coming to the end of the journey and you have to start wrapping storylines up and uh, that's, of course, the challenge. You know, it's like, you know, you're taking this, you know, eight, we did 86 episodes. It's this really long journey, you know, to the moon. And then you've got to stick the landing in one specific spot. And, you know, there's a lot of balls in the air and a lot of character development that needs to be wrapped up in a, in a way that feels satisfying. Uh, so that was always on our mind, uh, you know, and it certainly as we got into the later episodes. But, uh, you know, we just sat down and I think we started talking. I think the genesis of, uh, soprano home movies 
we had talked about an idea where uh, there's a house party with a bunch of the guys and a fight breaks out and somebody gets murdered in front of one of the wives. And that is like, what, what do you do? You know, wow. like, holy shit. You know, and you know, obviously the wow. guys, the guys are what they are and they understand, you know, what this is, but it happens. It just gets out of hand. And one of the wives and subsequently who then becomes a widow right in that room is now a witness to this. And how do they deal with that? That morphed into, to soprano home movies well okay what if it's you know uh, who, who are these two people who get into a fight and it happens in front of two wives janice and carmella and it's and it was bacala and tony but that that was the genesis of that idea I remember which was it was really interesting and exciting and we went down that road for a few days and then that morphed into the episode which you know was one of my favorites was there a lot of talk um before you went into while you were breaking down the last season was there like overarching things of tone regarding like Tony's darkness kind of coming home to ro coming home to roost, like his karma, you know, uh, all this evil that he's done kind of really starting to take root in his personality and psyche? Was that like intentional and was that like developed? I'm sure it was. I don't remember specific conversations about it, but based on the things that had come before, uh, you know, Tony's, uh, you know, just mental state and the, just the, the, the crumbling of his, his world and the crew and New York becoming a bigger presence in the mob world and his dissatisfaction, you know, with the development of his children, even though they were on, you know, by any measure successful, you know, they weren't what he wanted them to be and even even the idea that you know meadow ultimately goes to law school but she's gonna you know she talks about becoming a doctor you know which in his mind would have really been helping people and then she goes to law school which you think oh that'd be great but she's ultimately going to be he knows she's going to end up representing criminals like he is so i mean is that that's the progress in the family you know it's good and yet it's still not really contributing to anything and then you know of course and then as the the story develops. I mean, the whole world starts to come apart, and the the, the whole destruction of of everything. And you know, certainly having gotten shot, uh, you know, gave Tony a new perspective on things. Uh, you know, each day is a gift, whether or not he actually believed that or not. You know, that whole um, mindset was certainly weighing on him very heavily. Uh, Terry, how early on did you know what the ending was going to be? The very ending, like the cut yeah. to black. Thing? Uh, at least a year in advance. Uh, I, 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 David, I may dispute this, but I'm almost like 99% certain that David came in uh, once and said, I about a year and a half earlier and said, I think I want to do a thing where we just, we just go out in the middle of a scene. And he pitched it to me and Matt Weiner. We both, both thought it was a great idea. It was really different. You know, uh, it had never been done before and it just felt very daring and very unexpected. The other thing, and David disputes this, and I swear it's true, he had talked about the ending being Junior shooting Tony, uh, and, to, and the, the, this, the, the scene that ends members only, where Tony's on the floor having been shot by Uncle Junior, and he's trying to reach for the phone, and you're not sure if he does it, going out on that at the end of the series. Wow. I'm not sure if Tony lives or dies and whether or not Uncle Junior killed him. I know David pitched that as the potential end of the series, and then it became uh, the end of the season opener for uh whatever was that c was that a or b six a or six b i don't even remember honestly um wow interesting so was that was six, six a, I think. yeah were there people gonna get whacked that didn't get whacked or vice versa was there people that got a reprieve from the governor do you remember any of that like for some reason like this guy well let's kill so and so uh let's not kill him do you remember any of that uh, probably, shit? Pro probably, and I can't remember. What I do remember is that we started killing so many people. We had to, it was always an infusion of new crew members. There's always these new faces who, you know, suddenly like Walden was there. And, yeah. uh, you right. know, people we never, you know, you know, honestly, a couple of actors, right? You know, when I go back and look at the show, I go, oh, right. Yeah. Because we were running out of, uh, of, of, there was so much cannon fodder, uh, you know, among these crews. We're like, you know, we had to like keep, keep casting new people to fill in fill in the, the crew is literally going to be like three people left. So uh, there were, you know, that gave opportunities for other actors to, to step up. I mean, we had that one episode where um, I, I think it might've been in the John, Johnny Sack's wedding with the, the character Perry, the big muscle bound kid who suddenly appears as Tony's driver. 
you know, we had never really seen him before, but he, he came and went pretty quickly, but we just, again, needed more crew. Uh, you know, we always assumed, okay, well, just because we're in the pork store with the main guys doesn't mean there are more people in the Soprano crew that we haven't met. They just haven't been. It's amazing. When we cut away from the pork store, those guys happened to come in the back door and the camera wasn't there, but they were always around, you know, it's that kind of thing. So we just said, yeah, there's, it's a much bigger crew. We just don't feature everybody in it. I mean, besides what you mentioned with like a, a wife being witness to a murder, were there any other um, ideas, concepts, storylines that you thought were pretty cool that just didn't make it? You know, we we were pretty surprised by the ending. We had a uh, a little board on the wall with kind of just random notions. Uh, you know, we for years, uh, Bear terrorizes Soprano family was on that board. And we could never figure out how to do it because we would read these articles about bears wandering into yards in northern New Jersey. And they would always say, there's something there. I just don't know what it is. And eventually we figured it out, you know, with the episode where the, the two tones. Uh, so there was a lot of stuff on that board. And I, I have to say, I think 90 percent of it was eventually used somehow. You know, we wanted to do something with an Italian feast. We wanted to do, um, you know, the bear thing. Uh, stuff with T Paulie's mother. So there's very few things uh, we didn't get to. I think we may have even talked about the last time a couple of ideas that were developed and then didn't make it, you know, for one reason or another. We wanted to do a whole episode about uh, the whatever we called it, the seventh floor in the hospital, where it's like the VIP floor that a lot of yeah. very, you know, hospitals have that most people don't know about. That's where, you know, celebrities go and that Tony sort of finagles away and calls in a favor and gets, you know, just basically examining the inequities in the healthcare system and how rich people get treated differently and how Tony gets it. But we felt like, you know what, we got to get out of that hospital. It was a great idea, a great concept. I'm sure it would have been enlightening and funny, but it was like, we just can't go back to that hospital anymore. And I think we did. That was a good decision. And then I think you, Michael, I, we might have talked about this, too. You, we developed a story where there was some crazy guy outside the uh the pork store who's obsessed with the the, the pig Andrew um, Lugo, uh, yeah, yeah. Older, or older. He, yeah he he said that he he actually wrote uh, she's a rainbow and she's then a rainbow. Rainbow. <laughs> and that just you know it was just sort of but we were we were I'm telling you you know I've been on a bunch of shows and there's a lot of stuff uh you know that gets tossed in the can and you you develop it and it doesn't go anywhere but we were really pretty good about taking something and sticking with it. I think it's a matter of really a patience you know and really say all right you know it's this the story process is the hardest part of the writing but not even close the writing is a pleasure and yeah. the the, uh, the tendency is to want to write the script and you just keep saying oh all right yeah i got it i know what i'll do and inevitably not inevitably but mo more times than not you end up writing yourself into a corner if you don't know where you're going if i jumped in my car right now said i'm driving to new york and i just started heading east eventually i figure it out but it'd be a lot easier if I put the GPS in and I knew exactly where I was headed. And that's what an outline is for writers. And, but, you know, plotting out that story is, is so hard. And you, the tendency is to want to either chuck it or, uh, just start writing. And, and we would sit there for days on end. And sometimes every season we would start the season and David, you know, he would be on the couch or something and we'd be talking for days and he'd say, it's, it's, it's never this hard. Why is it so hard this year? And I usually would be the one to say, it's always this hard. And no, no, last, last season we had, a, we had two outlines by this point and I'd have to get the writer's assistant. What was the first outline we had? No, that didn't come for six weeks. They really, yeah. And I said, it's good. We're, we're okay. You know, and, but it, this was every year. I mean, every year it was like, it, it can't possibly be this hard. And it is, that's, that's the job, you know, and eventually you figure it out. And hopefully, you know, the one thing I always, you know, I think gave him comfort and all of his comfort. I said, here's the thing too, if, if we don't have anything or what we have sucks, don't worry. We're not leaving this room until it doesn't suck. We're not leaving this room until it's great. So we're just going to figure it out. So just strap in and let's just keep talking. You know, we'll get, it'll, we'll get there, you know? So that was, that was how we did it. Uh, okay. A couple of things out that I have here. All right. I've talked to you about a few of these things. What significance does mayonnaise have on the show? <laughs> you know, it really doesn't have any significance other than it's funny. You know, it's almost, I hate to get go like, even like, you know, words with a K are funny. Pickle is a funny word. Yeah. It's, it, it's just a funny thing. You know, here's the thing too. When Paulie's got the mayonnaise on his chin yeah. and Tony says, mayonnaise, mayonnaise. If, uh, seriously, if he said you got mustard on your chin, mustard. 
it's just not as funny. I don't know why. It's just funny. Um, <laughs> I don't know where else. I'm assuming mayonnaise appears. There was a few other spots. All right. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, I know there's a t- scene where Tony was like eating cold cuts, like dipping them in mayonnaise. And eating. Yeah. it's just, it's just, it's just such a, uh, you know, it is too. I think part of it is it's such an American thing. It's such a white bread American thing. You know, like, you know, Jews always say, oh, it's, it's the white people eat mayonnaise. And, you know, I think part of I, I think the idea of it is that the, here's this Italian American who is so Americanized that he eats mayonnaise like any other. You know, he may he eat mayonnaise on Wonder Bread, just like any other guy, you know. So uh, I think what about it. eggs? What's the significance of eggs? I, I don't know that there is one. I, I think well, Ralphie was making eggs. Eggs pop up, right, Michael? Numerous times. Well, you yeah. Know, people have to eat, Steve. You know, uh, <laughs> what about Phil Leotardo coming out of the closet? Gay, not no, gay. That was a, you know, probably, a, yeah, a, 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 a visual joke that we did to help the suggestion that he may or may not be closeted. Uh, you know, but I mean, and you know, again, read into it what you will. I mean, look, you know, we also did the cut, uh, you know, I think Vito and his lover start to kiss. And then we did the, the thing from, uh, uh, what, what Hitchcock movie where the train is going into the tunnel at the end with Carrie yeah. Grant. And, you know, the, that was clearly an homage to that and also suggesting what might be happening back in Vito's uh, place. Vito was a catcher. We, we had told us Vito was the catcher. Apparently, yeah. So, uh, you know, but it's funny. There were other things like, you know, that had no significance at all. Like other than like Tony used to eat a, ba- a, a ba- Bialy every morning. That was because I used to eat Bialy's every morning. So I just wrote that. So then that became Tony. I was there was a time when Glenn Livet was my drink. Tony used to drink Glenn Livet. That was just my thing. I like uh, Arnold Palmer's. Tony would order an all part. You know, it's just, uh, you know, you're right. Go, I'll just give him what I do. And then it became his. There's no other significance other than it's, you know, I, I, Tony might like this too. Okay. Right. But also you're thinking, you know, by then you're so deep into this world uh, as a writer, as a creator, Terry, that like, you're, you know, even though you're making a choice, it's from your life, but you know, somehow it's right. It fits him. Oh, because yeah. you understand the character. Not nothing becomes arbitrary, is what. No, you know, no. I, if it was something, I think, as a something too weird, uh, you know, uh, if from uh, that didn't fit the character. You know, it turns out, you know, Tony Soprano and I and Jim and I were almost the same age. Yeah, exactly. So I had I in my own life had the same pop culture references he did. I had the same. I grew up. He grew up in New Jersey. I grew up in New York. We have so many of the same references. So it was easy for me to put myself in the mindset of a Tony Soprano. I knew where he was in 1978. He was exactly where I was. You know, so I reference a club or a, you know, uh, music show, music that he absolutely knows. You know, so it was was actually fun. So he probably, you know, there's probably certain similarities in in other things too. How did you find uh, Walk Like a Man, which is this episode, uh, your first time you directed? How was that? Was it intimidating? Were you comfortable at that point? Were you? Is that the only thing you ever directed? It is. It is. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I've always had tremendous respect and still do for directors. And uh, it's funny. It's the one job in this business where you seem to have almost need no qualifications to do, even though it's the most important <laughs> job. By that, I mean, people will say, I, and early on in my career, I'd write a script and somebody go, oh, you're going to direct it? And I go, no, I'm not going to direct it. Why not? So I'm not a director. I, I don't know how to do it. I don't know the first thing about it. But basically, the only thing you need to do to be a director in this business is say, hey, I'm a director, and then get people to give you money and then direct something. It's like, it feels like that. You can actually just get the most important job by just declaring, stay, planting your flag and saying, that's who I am. I wouldn't do that. You wouldn't do that if you were a DP or a costume designer. They say, well, what else? Have you cut anyone's hair before? What, are you going to now be the hair? <laughs> well, you can be the fucking director. You can have the most important job. So you know, over the years, I remember David said to me at one point, they said, hey, there's some second unit stuff. Do you want to direct it? And I was like, no. I, I was like panicking. I was like, I, I don't know how to do this. So years went by, of, you know, you know, all of the writers, somebody, there's always a writer on set producing the episode. And we, our producing was creative producing in the sense of making sure that what's in the script is getting onto film the way we wanted it and working closely with the director. So I observed the greatest directors in TV for years on this show. 
So slowly went, but I still wasn't particularly interested in directing. And somebody said to me, somebody's going to direct something you write and screw it up. And that's going to make you want to direct. And lo and behold, that finally happened. It was a movie I wrote uh, that I was really proud of called Get Rich or Die Trying. And without going into details, I was just very unhappy with how it turned, how the movie turned out. The movie ultimately bore almost no resemblance to the original script I wrote. And I said, you know what? And it was literally right after that movie happened. I walked into David at the beginning of season six, A or B, whatever it was. And uh, I had a whole big speech prepared. And I went into David. I knocked on his door and I said, I'd like to talk to you. I said, I, uh, uh, I think I'd like to direct. And he said, oh, OK, uh, you'd write the episode, too. I said, yeah, he goes. All right. What about episode five? I went, uh, 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 OK. I said, do you want to hear my reasons? He went, not really. I was like, OK. And then I turned around. I went out and I went, oh, my God, I've got to do this now. Mm-hmm. Oh, <laughs> shit. So then I went into full. So the way I you know, stave off that panic is just be super prepared. So I just went into mm-hmm. full director mode like i started trailing everybody like now with a really keen eye toward what do i do how does this work really and i I was blessed to have phil abraham our brilliant cinematographer as my dp and then phil directed that year as well for the first time so i had phil and i had tim van patten helping me like just we we just scouting doing everything so i was super super ready and planned out the other thing so and i've told this story before but it's it's great and and it and it really speaks to the love we had on this set so day one 6 a.m there's a scene i think it's michael uh christopher and paulie maybe or christopher and somebody in a car outside the hardware store talking in a car i don't remember who it was it might have been you and, and paulie and i i say okay action and you guys do your cut and I, you do your scene and i watch it on the uh, monitor and they say all the words and it's like holy shit, this is working they're actually filming it and as soon as you stop talking i go cut and then I realized immediately I cut too soon. I should have let it drift a little. So I walked over to Billy Coleman, our camera operator, and I said, Billy, I, I fucked up. He goes, What's the matter? I go, I, I think I cut too soon. And Billy said, I didn't cut. <laughs> he goes, Don't worry about it. He goes, Listen, he said, he said, look around. He said, You see all these people? They all love you. You can't fuck this up. We got you back. We're gonna get this done. It's gonna be great. All you have to worry about is deal with the actors and everything else is going to be done. He said, you can't mess this up. So just, just don't worry about it. We got you. I was like, holy shit, what a gift. I mean, to be working with your friends and people who are that so good. And it was a joy. I mean, from that, I wasn't nervous at all. I had so much fun. Uh, and it, it was great. I, I think the episode turned out really well. I got some amazing performances. I mean, Robert Eiler, in that episode just it was phenomenal and i remember even you know directing robert and jim and here's the thing too directing you those guys i mean by this point too i mean i you know i'd have a couple of notes i'd have a couple of let's try this let's try that but for the most part you know you just had to let them do their thing i remember one time jim came up to me uh we were we we rehearsed a scene a very poignant intense scene between jim and robert eiler and robert in the rehearsal is emotional and Jim came up to me and said, I don't know what you're planning, but if I were you, I would get his side first because I don't know how long any actor can get to keep that level. I, I had thought the same thing. Let's get Robert done because he was so there. But it was great. It was uh, it was really, really amazing. And uh, it was I had worked really closely with Sidney Walensky, uh, the editor, uh, doing the <laughs> editing the Echo Awards. Uh, <laughs> so I, I had a very good shorthand with Sidney. So it was great. I, I did my cut. I handed it to David. And I'd say it was, you know, really close to what I gave him, which was also very flattering because David, you know, has very uh, exacting standards and he was really happy with it. You know, and that said, it's like I really enjoyed doing it. But I work with so many incredible, talented directors that I don't have the passion to, to have to direct things. Around. I probably at some point in my life will do it again, but I'm not. I'm so happy being a writer and I love that. And again, when I have Alan Coulter or Tim Van Patten or somebody like that to direct for me, what, what I would never be that arrogant to go, no, I, let me do it. Like I got those guys to do it and I don't have to get up at four o'clock in the morning. Great. Call me when you're when, call me when you're about to start shooting and I'll be there and they they handle it so it's great it was a really good experience um glad i did it i absolutely love that you just cited the your experience with the echo awards as part of your education in filmmaking absolutely I, editing you know comedy as you know is gotta be, it's, it's a lot of work nanosecond yeah i'm, I'm sitting he would go crazy i'd be like you gotta like cut hair right there and then cut to the 
we we go that would go on those editing sessions go on for days. And Terry, uh, you that, was, to, that was very good. Put that out on YouTube. Yeah. The awards. You need to put that out there. That's a good idea. I mean, really. I mean, the because they were the hilarious. Fans, I mean, the fans were so much fun. It was I did, one thing I did that we should definitely put on. I did a thing uh, one year. We didn't, it wasn't quite the Eccle Awards, but I took footage. Uh, it was the year, one of the last years, where Michael, you were you were the only cast member nominated for uh, an Emmy that year, I think, or or uh, I think maybe you and Jim. So uh, I, I took footage from the show and then had the voices redubbed. So basically, what it is, it starts with Michael showing up at Tony's house. And he rings the bell and Jim answers. And it's when he's you're coming over there to tell him about Adriana. But I revoiced, Michael did the revoicing and he came. He's like, Tony, I got to, what's the matter? And you go to the basement. Michael says, I, I was the only one nominated for an Emmy. And Michael's crying. <laughs> and Jim grabs him and slaps him and rips his shirt. And Michael goes, oh, I'm going to wear that shirt at the Emmy Awards. <laughs> and it was, it was so well. And then slowly throughout the course of the film, it's different. It's Christopher basically breaking the news to, to, to other cast members. And it's as it happened, we had Edie crying. We had Tony Sirico crying. So it's, it's all Michael telling them that he was nominated for Emmy and they weren't. And then Edie starts crying. And so it worked really, it was really funny. It worked really well, if I say so myself. That the, fans, would be the fans would love that. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I had to dig that out. Uh, Terry, what, and uh, who was your favorite character? It's it's really hard. I mean, I think I have to say Uncle Junior. Uh, yeah, me too. Me too. He's just so fucking funny. I mean, th first of all, Dominic is such a joy uh, in it, just in general, personally, and as Uncle Junior, I mean, such a curmudgeon. So he's like, you know, he's like a cross between like Mr. Magoo, Yosemite Sam, uh, every cartoon character who's just annoyed and pissed off at the world, and such a sneak and petty and. Uh, <laughs> He always made me laugh, and uh, anybody with Uncle Junior, it, he, he, it just always was funny and such so fun to write for because he was, you know, this old man who'd come out with these like antiquated expressions and just things I love to hear. Like I just, you know, any kind of old timey references or returns of a phrase. You don't get to write for young characters, but Uncle Junior would just make he made a reference to Judge Crater. I was able to like, shit that you just like, what the fuck is that? Or the cats and jammer kids or yeah, it's just, it was really fun to, to put yourself in that, in that head, you know? Yeah. I love them. But I mean, they were all, I mean, Christopher was amazing. Paulie, Tony, they were all, everybody was fun to write for. And then, you know, you, Steve, you and you and Dominic together, of course, was just gold. You know, once the first time you guys were together, we were like in the, I think it was like the waiting room or something. Be like holy shit this is like one of those combos that you you know throw michael and tony sirico together you got another great combination sometimes you just actors who just worked so well together and you and dominic immediately yeah, yeah. I, love I remember it. you that didn't happen on the podcast i thought it would but it didn't no. on this <laughs> we never fucking clicked ever <laughs> i remember never up that episodes <laughs> in terry we never clicked you see it's like, or it's like martin and lewis you guys you know off stage you know you guys go your own way but you know great you no actually, you said to me early on uh during season two when uncle junior was on house arrest you called me up and you said is we ever getting out of this fucking house and i said you don't want to get out of the house you said what do you mean i said if he's in the house he needs somebody to talk to you're the only guy in there so i go you gotta keep him in that house forever he goes oh <laughs> you're right I go, he leaves the house he can talk to anybody he doesn't need you anymore. So you I loved I loved working with Dominic. He was oh yeah, he's, he's the best, beautiful guy. What uh, What do you think the legacy of the Sopranos is? Man, uh, you know it, it. It I think it's a high water mark, and you know I, it feels really awkward talking about this because obviously we were involved in it and did it. So it feels very self serving. But I'm talking about it from the perspective of David and the thing he created. Uh, it, it represents a high watermark in, uh, in certainly in TV history and, uh, and, and more so in, uh, in the history of cinema in a bigger sense, you know, even though it's not exactly film, I look, things are morphing into, I don't even know that it matters anymore. You know, it's all, uh, you know, it's all sort of the same. Uh, but yeah, really it, it sort of represents a golden age and a, um, a period uh, of transition in a medium where uh, things just soared, elevated to a new level. I mean, where suddenly it was as good as anything that had ever been done in film and done in a long form over the course of 86 hours, where it just, 
it just elevated an entire medium and, and the biggest medium maybe in in america i mean tv was you know we all grew up watching a billion hours of it so it, it changed everything and i think uh i think people will remember that you know it's interesting and again it just sounds you know i don't want to i have to put it you have to put it in context you know when i talk to young film students about movies and stuff and i you, you always citizen kane always comes up and they watch it they go yeah it was, it was good it was okay like well you have to put yourself in 1939 and watch citizen kane there was never anything like that done before there was never a documentary a fake documentary within a film that was supposed to be real and those tracking shots and those those uh those camera angles and the performances and all that stuff you know so i think you know, again, and I don't, it's comparing Sopranos to Citizen Kane sounds so douchey, but in the sense that it changed everything. You never had a TV series like this before. I think the closest thing you had was, uh, in terms of groundbreaking stuff, you know, Twin Peaks, uh, which only went on for a couple of years. And, you know, there were moments on Oz, I remember watching for the first time, like, oh my God, wow, that's, I can't believe they did that. But I think Sopranos was different because it wasn't just shock value stuff. It was, it really made you think and uh it just felt so real yeah All right. i mean you can make a direct line from the sopranos to al pacino eventually doing a tv series i Absolutely. think the sopranos Absolutely. was the catalyst for that to kind of come about eventually yeah. i mean people i think people in the film world who realize who, who, who always thought tv was kind of the thing was a step down realized like wow you can do great work and you know while i was on the sopranos and boardwalk empire i can't i i can name five a list actors and actresses who reached out to me either personally or through their reps to say i will do i, I am interested in doing a series uh think of me please think of me for things like that that you're doing because sure. the idea of yeah you know, i had one guy whose name i won't mention but said if i have to put on another spandex suit and run around you know against the green screen i'm going to jump out a window i want to play a character and, and dig in and act and, and do that for three or four years you know, right. you go, yeah, I get it. You know, Terry, you have an opportunity to do that. In film. I told you not to mention the spandex. Come on, man. What the <laughs> Sorry, fuck? I knew people were going to know. It's what the idiot. fuck? They know it's me. <laughs> what the fuck? All right, you're right. You can All edit, right, listen. edit this out. And people okay. Okay. Let's cut that. Andy, cut that out, please. Steve's going right. to be embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> right now. <laughs> okay. Two things here. The, the final scene. David told us. Uh, we said about Jamie Lynn, you know, Meadow Cook and Park and all that, you know. Uh, and he said it was just a young girl parking. He wasn't building tension. Do you believe that? Well, he, I believe if he says it, I believe he wasn't intending to build tension, but he sure was. I mean, it, it certainly had the effect of being tense. As you keep, you know, you're just like, God, what is happening? Is she going to park? Is she not? Is somebody going to come up on her? It worked to build tension. He's coming on. Up. He's coming on again, and we're going to ask him again. No, um, and it, it was almost ten o'clock. That's the whole thing. We know this is it. Yeah, this is the last. Yeah, well, yeah whether it was intentional, I have no idea, but it, it absolutely was tense. So, yeah. no. uh, is Tony Soprano alive or dead, Terry? In your opinion, uh, I in swear, your opinion, I swear to God, I don't know. I don't think about it in those terms. Uh, you know, I, I all right. I guess to be, if I had to be honest, in the moments where I do think about that, and I don't know why I waste time thinking about a fictional character from a TV show I used to work on, but in my mind, I do imagine him being alive. I do think like, what would he be doing now? But that's only because if I played that game the other way, if I said, oh, well, he's dead, then there's nothing to think about. There's no exercise there. But I go, yeah, I wonder if, yeah, okay, if Tony were alive, what would he be doing now? And that's as far as I've taken it. So if that's an answer, then that's an answer. But I, you know, in the context of the show, I, you know, I, I just accepted it for what it was. I think he's alive. Michael has gone back and forth. I think he's now leaning where well, Michael told He's dead? Dead, dead. <laughs> I think he, you know, I go back and forth between thinking he didn't die, that there's no answer because it just ends right there, and he did die. And and I, so I hear David say different things at different times now, like it seems. Yeah, I mean, well, there's no right answer. You know, you don't there's no see right answer. anything. You know, I mean, it, you know, it, it, maybe is the answer. I, I do not know, which is great. It's I really like it that way. I mean, I used to love 
the ambiguity. I love the ambiguity. Ultimately, uh, you know, as much as I wanted to pay off the Pine Barrens thing, I love the ambiguity of not knowing what happened to that guy. You just don't Me know. Too. So the Me too. Me too. If Tony Soprano's dead, it's a good possibility they killed the entire family. And I don't want to think about that. That's, yeah, the last for sure. And uh, yeah, that's something, you know, when, when in the uproar after the episode, you know, I remember people said, well, what, did you want to see that whole family get killed? Is that what you wanted? And people were like, no, no, of course not. Go, okay, well, did you want to see Tony get killed in front of his family? No, no, of course. What do you want? I don't know. <laughs> something else. And what then they, yeah, I guess it wasn't so. Uh, so many people, I think, ultimately came around, but it was months, months, and months later. Sometimes years later, like, yeah. Yeah, you know I guess it was okay. Because there's oh. nothing that could have satisfied everybody. No. Nothing. No. No way. Yeah. No. Yeah. It's true. It was yeah, a great even if Tony, if Tony killed all of his em enemies and then was victorious, he go like, oh, what a bullshit ending. Oh, it all right. out for Tony. <laughs> uh, it's like, so yeah, I don't know that there's any any. I mean, look, finales of, of anything are, are notoriously hard and ultimately leave people unsatisfied on some level. Because I think part of it is it's just the sadness of ending the thing you love. You know, when people start watching shows that I love or loved, I, I get jealous because I go, man, you're in for such a fucking ride. You know, I recommended the uh, the Singing Detective, the original Singing Detectives uh, miniseries to somebody recently. And I, uh, and I said, I, I love that so much. You're in for such a treat. I wish I had something that I love. It's now great. I love that. Yeah, me too. You know, one of the best endings is Blazing Saddles, right? Because they bust through and they're all right. of a sudden on a Hollywood musical set. Harvey Corman runs out of the studio gates and hails a cab and says, drive me off this picture. Yeah. Which I think is one of the best. It's brilliant. Yeah, it's perfect. Yeah. And it goes to a movie theater to yeah. see Blazing Saddles. Great. So great. Or the Bob Newhart, Newhart show. Newhart, right? Was yeah, it that, yeah. Yeah, where what he did he? How did that end? He, well, in the second New Hard Show, where he on the inn, the country inn, uh, in Vermont or New Hampshire or whatever, he he wake it cuts the black and he wakes up and he's in bed and he turns the light on and his wife it sits up in bed and it's Suzanne Plachet, I think, who was his wife in the original New Hard Show when he was a psychiatrist, and he says to her, "I kind of had the craziest dream that I owned a." Uh, and in somewhere and up, back to bed. And it was just, it was so great. It was just literally the whole thing was a dream from his old TV show. So like this podcast is a nightmare I'm having. I want to wake up. <laughs> well, it's so, funny, but you guys are coming to the end of this. So it's sort of like what we were saying before, like how we started the, you know, the last few episodes, it's got to be as much as it's hard work. And I know you guys can't stand each other. You know, it's got to be a little bittersweet, you know, where you go, um, you know, I'm not going to have anybody. You're going to have to go back to fighting with your dog. Uh, yeah. you know, uh, whatever, whatever. You know, you're not going to have each other. Terry, to that's not his dog. That's they bring it over. It's to establish him as this sweetheart. There's this wrangler that delivers that's it great. and trains it. And it's, it's all yeah, you know, it's, it's, a different, it's a different dog every time. Too. It's, 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 it's not. It's it's like to Michael, my whole yeah. persona. I'm just a fraud. <laughs> I'm a complete fraud. He hates animals. Yeah. Hates them. Uh, <laughs> Terry, thank you, man. I couldn't thank you enough. Thanks, boys. Enjoy ZZ Top in Vegas and really appreciate you. I absolutely will. And uh, always a pleasure. And uh, look, this, uh, I, I've had such a great time watching this show. I mean, I've learned so much about uh, the stuff that went on behind the scenes from other people's perspectives, which was just great. Uh, just, just hearing, and, and you guys have done so many uh, amazing shows. And what a great record of the time we we had together uh and uh I'll, I'll certainly miss this and if you guys just want to get together and do a zoom every once in a while let's just you know do okay. that for, uh, for all things. i'll do one just with you terry alone yeah uh, terry if you god forbid you get arrested i still got some people out there i, I intend to i'm gonna go i'm, take, I'm gonna take my mask off in the middle of the show i'm gonna take it off and anything off. happens let me know i said I'm just a phone call away, my friend. Absolutely. I'll just shine a big S in the sky in Vegas. All thank right, buddy. Thank you so much. Thank Great you seeing you guys. Take care. Thank Take care. You. Thank you, Terry. My nice. pleasure. All right. There you have it, folks. The great Terry, Terry Winter. Always a great interview. Always great talking to him. Yes, and sir. Just a ton of information. Yes, and now uh, we Here have... We episode that he both wrote and directed which we will break down after this be right back always good talking to terry 
uh, it's got a lot of good information. Good stuff. Good stuff. He's very smart and hilarious and very yeah. talented, Absolutely. gifted guy. Uh, and here we go. Walk Like a Man. Season, season seven, seven, episode five. May 6th, 2007 was the first airing. Uh, this is 17 out of 19 written by Terry, the first and only that he directed. Um, obviously, the title comes from the Four Seasons song. It's the second song named after a Frankie Valli, the Four Seasons song, the first being uh, Big Girls Don't Cry. Right? The lyric, you know, it's, a, it's about a father telling his son to get over the woman who left him. Walk like a man, talk like a man, my son. No woman's worth crawling on the earth. Kind of refers to Adriana a little bit. She crawled on the earth, maybe. But uh, um, also, obviously, with AJ and Tony, AJ's going through a bad breakup. And Christopher, I mean, this this episode uh, is another episode where you see really the scene, and they, they, we cut from AJ to Christopher, Christopher to AJ a lot. And a lot of it's about, you know, Tony being this kind of failed father figure to Christopher. And him being a father to AJ and and uh, Christopher being someone who didn't have a father. And, um, you know, the effects of that, the repercussions of that, it's very clear, you know, the points and the editing and, and the way this is put together, that that's what's going on here. It's pretty cool. You know, uh, Christopher and Tony's relationship, and you see it in this episode, has just gone south. Really south, yeah. Uh, Bobby kind of has taken kind of Christopher's place. It's kind of Silvio and Bobby kind of cut Christopher, you know, is dropped in the pecking order, it seems like, uh, you know, and a part of it is closer to sobriety. Soprano house, Tony wakes up, he walks down the stairs, he's singing a song. What is that, a Pink Floyd song? He's singing Comfortably Numb, which... Uh, in the next episode, when Christopher's in the car with him, you know, the last song that Christopher hears is that is Comfortably Numb. That's almost uh, foreshadowing Christopher's death in a way. And Christopher's dead in the next one, correct? Kennedy and Heidi, is that it? That's, no, wait, there's a, which one is this? Number, this is number five. Yeah. Christopher, Christopher dies. dies in six, yeah. It's the next episode. Uh, Tony walks into the kitchen. AJ, he said, what are you doing up so early? AJ, I couldn't sleep. Carmela's making French toast. He's watching uh, Tom and Jerry. Uh, yeah. Good did you, cartoon. did you, did they have cartoons when you were a kid? <laughs> they had the books, you know, the books. They, <laughs> Um, did you like Tom you know, and Jerry? I, when you I, I used to listen to radio shows. That's how old I am. <laughs> radio shows. Did Did you like Tom and Jerry? Yes, absolutely. I very, used to love Tom and Jerry. Uh, it's very clever, very funny. I was a big cartoon yeah. person like you. Yeah, me too. I was a me too. Funny guy. I liked all those. You know, uh, Foghorn, Leghorn. Uh, you know, I love Sylvester. And the, and Bugs Bunny was my hero when I was a kid because he was, uh, you know, courageous and funny. Didn't give a shit, you know. I was a big Popeye. Smart. I like Popeye. I like Popeye. Yeah. You know those cartoons are very funny. All those Warner Brother cartoons, right? I mean, you know, that whole gang was great. All those characters. Yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah, Carmella was making French house. It's comfort food. It'll make you feel better. What the fuck? The guy, I mean, AJ's kind of got a point here. You know, I mean, his girl left him. The guy's heartbroken. She she thinks French house is going to make him feel better. And he snaps at her. You know, it's hard to, you know, it's hard for you to believe food may not be the answer to every problem. My fiance left me. The job is all I got. He said, and Tony says, neither is being a whiny ass bitch. bitch. Got a shitty ass pizza job. Shitty ass, shitty ass pizza job. And she's waffles, French toast, whatever. Make you French feel toast. better. Listen, and, 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 anyone who's ever gone through a breakup understands what, what this kid's going through. Sure. He's been 
completely exhausted. He's thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking. And who she with and who she's with. It's a horrible feeling. And no one can fix it. No one could make you feel better. No, only time. Time is the only thing that heals that kind of wound. I, I could and talk it, to yeah. you blue in the face. Time and going out and getting laid. Forcing yourself if you had to. Forcing yourself. Even if you don't forcing want Forcing yourself, yeah. Forcing yourself to go out and spend, love the one you're with, you know, just honestly, guy, girl, whatever is it that is. Your, is that your motto, like your life no, kind of? You know, you sit around moping and you're thinking and thinking. We've all gone through breakups in our life, some worse than others. Guys, some people never recover, girl or guy. They never recover. They, they're not devastated, you know. And, and it happens, especially when you're younger. Uh, uh, you know, this kid, it's his first love. You know, he's fucked up. And he, he's thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking, you know. And he went all in. He stopped hanging out with his friends. And guys do that, too, you know. Like, you know, you, you're with the girl 24-7, and you kind of, you know what I mean? You, you've seen that. Yeah. You've had friends that do that, right? You know? uh, and you don't see the, you don't see your friends anymore, and until he, they break up, then he pops out, he gets another girl, and he's gone. The same shit, you know. Uh, she says that Carmela says better to have loved and lost. That comes from Tennyson. Uh, Tennyson, who said, um, and and I, "Than to have never loved at all. Better to have loved to and lost." Poster in the seventies, wasn't that a poster? Like better to have loved and lost than. To have never loved at all, which doesn't really, when you're heartbroken, none of that helps. And the same, um, what was the other one? Uh, if you love something, set it, it free. Comes, if it, set it free if it comes back. And then the other bullshit, there was another bullshit one. Uh, yeah, there's another one. I'll think of it. You know, but they had them on the posters and in the cards and all that bullshit philosophical stuff that does nothing. But you said love the one you're with. I like that. Is that your personal no. philosophy? That's a song. So it's <laughs> no, it, but it's, it's not your personal philosophy. It is my philosophy. Fuck it. You just, listen, even if you don't want it, you just got to go out there. That's what I did. You know, the college breakup. If I could just go out there and just fucking go bang away as much as I well, could. Keep your that's mind. That's what Tony mind. tells him. Tony tells him later on in the episode, go get a blowjob. You know, you just got to. You know, kind of force yourself to get back out there. You may not, you know, have a one night stand. As long as it's uh, consensual, fuck it. Spend some time with somebody. Yeah, you know, I agree. You know, you know, what are you going to do here? Uh, the hardware store, Christopher arrives. Al's his father in law is selling the hot power tools, right? That's Dennis Palladino who plays Al Lombardo, Kelly's father, Christopher's That's a nice father in law. Job. Nice job. Nice job, yeah. He he, he does. I, I thought he was excellent in this role. These are the power tools that they made the deal down in Florida with the uh, Cubans. Uh, Tony and Paulie made down in Miami. Uh, they got a miter saw that's six hundred dollars. Usually, they're selling hot ones for two hundred bucks. They're lined up out the door. There's co a lot of them are cops. Off duty cops because they, you know, cops and firemen. They always have side jobs. Uh, you know, a lot of different businesses. They're lined up out the door. Christopher comes in. He's a uh, uh, Al says uh, calls him a movie producer. He calls him a movie producer. Movie producer. So he's kind of proud uh, of that. Yeah, I mean, also, I, uh, obviously, Christopher's doing this power tool thing. But one of the reasons why the 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 relationship with him and Tony gone south uh, went south is because Christopher is not his head's not so in the game anymore. You know, he. I think he really wants to do other things. It's not just keeping away from the Bing and the pork store because of his sobriety. It's also, I think he got a taste of what he really wants to do. And I, I think I this kind of shit is boring him. Got the big house. He's got a kid. Listen, a lot of times kids really change people. Yeah. Really change people. Almost immediately. You know, you have the kid and, and you're, you're a different guy or a different girl. I mean, you got a responsibility and, and it's just, sometimes it'll help you sober up. I got to take care of this kid. Look what I brought into the world. I think Christopher's got some of that. He's got a nice girlfriend. Okay, Kelly's completely different. Adriana was a nice girl. She was also like a fucking mob wife, you know. 
you know, she played the whole game too. Kelly's not in like that. You know what I mean? She doesn't. No. He's not in like that, you know. Uh, and he doesn't want her in like that. No, no. Uh, the bottom being, Paulie and Christopher talk upstairs. Paulie, those. Uh, you see Tony Sirico in this scene? Boom, 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 boom. He's, he must have practiced that in the mirror. Yeah, the thing with the thing and the thing. He, he they make some very significant <laughs> He worked it out to oh, the he worked nth that degree. Out. That's yes. harder to me. That would be so hard to me to, you know, well, you know, when I say this word, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do this, I'm going to point. I mean, that would be really hard for me to put all that together. Yeah, I I don't know how to do that either. You know, I mean, you, it's, do, you know, it's in your head. You, you know, <laughs> it works for him. Um, Christopher says, you ain't seen this many cops lined up since the centennial of Dunkin' Donuts. Great, great line. Uh, he gets 12 grand is Christopher's cut uh, of this. That's Paulie's um, cut. What do you think? Paulie's cut. cut. Christopher has his own cut. Uh, and Paulie says, you've been a real drip. Can't you be normal? Christopher said, it's hard for some of us to be normal. When I was using drugs, I'm a disgrace. Now I'm sober and now I'm a drip. And, you know, this is some of the problems he's been facing as well, is that, uh, you know, they don't understand this sobriety. They just think, have a drink once in a while. Don't let it get out of control. They don't understand addiction. And this is very common. You know, I have my uh, my uh, wife's cousin, uh, like the older uncles and stuff. They kind of made fun of him. What are you? What are you, weak? You know, it's a sign of weakness that you can't handle this. A lot of people think, you know, you do drug or alcohol, you're weak. And and that's part of it, too. Now, uh, there's a thing that you don't toast with water. A lot of people believe that's bad luck. You know that, right? Oh, yeah. A yeah. lot of people do. Unless you're both toasting with water. Unless everybody's toasting with water, then it's well, okay. He's got club soda. You know, he's breaking his fucking balls. You know, like you said... I'm a disgrace when I'm fucked up, and now I'm a drip. What do you want from me? You know, right? I mean, exactly. You know, they, they're out of line. Then he says, "Come on, let's go have some prime rib." He says, "No, I'm going to pass." What? You're watching your cholesterol too. So, you know, he, he's in a no-win situation with these guys here. You know, uh, and, and you know the peer pressure. You know, Tony breaks his balls more than anybody. What the fuck? Right, exactly. What does he want from Not him? everybody can handle it, you know. The pork store, Tony walks over, Agent Harris, uh, and, and Agent Goddard. Uh, Agent Harris, Matt Savito, always great. He loves them sandwiches. Loves, loves, that loves the pork store, yeah. Loves the heroes there. You know? Yeah, their relationship is very interesting. And he, uh, Matt spoke about it uh, when he came on our podcast, you know, um, he talked about the complex relationship between him and Tony. You know, uh, I, I, anybody who's interested, go back and look at that episode because he, he, it's a very good interview. And, and Matt really thinks a lot into the character. Um, there's a mutual respect in some ways. I mean, Tony hates the feds, but he does kind of respect Agent Harris out of any of them. Yeah. He does have certain, they relate on a certain level. Agent Harris says, I never liked Phil Leotardo. He tried to set up a rookie, a rookie FBI uh, agent uh, for to be raped and be beaten. You know, he's got a he hates Phil Leotardo, as yeah. does Tony. Yeah. You know, uh, Tony is a murderer and he's all these things. That wouldn't be something he would do. He's not that guy, Tony. He's murderer. not a sadist. No. For, no, he's a killer and he takes care of business and does what, you know, obviously that's part of the life he leads, but I don't think he's... No, Phil you know, is. Phil's, Phil's sick, yeah. You saw you saw what they did to Vito. Yeah, that was sick. Ralphie was a sadist. Ralphie was sick. So was Richie Aprile. Those, those are the twisted guys yeah. who want... They enjoy people yeah. suffering. Yeah, I don't see... Uh, I don't think Christopher was a flat-out murderer. I think he murdered, what, 16 people or something. But I don't see Christopher being that guy either. Christopher took care of business, as Silvio did. You know what I mean? They just took care of business. Paulie, I don't think he was that guy. I didn't get that much enjoy. It's part of the job. I think guys like Ralphie and Phil, they enjoyed it. He sat on the bed and watched them 
whatever they did with the pull stick, shove it up Vito's butt, or whatever he did there. They tortured him. Yeah, it. he enjoyed it. Yeah, he watched that. Uh, you know, uh, he's uh, Tony's telling him. I, you know, I ran into these guys. They had talked about it earlier. If you see something, let us know. And he tells him about Ahmed and, and, and uh, uh, Muhammad. Calls he Christian. doesn't really tell him anything, though. I mean, first of all, he says, hey, if I do have info, what do I get for it, basically? Do I get something? And he says, well, I'll write a 5K letter, which means, you know, it talks about your cooperation and what service. What is that? Is that really a thing? Puts I, in, I imagine it is. Because, you know, when, when, for when I get in trouble, it sounds like. Yes, no. absolutely. Because when you do go for sentencing, your lawyer makes a case. Hey. He yeah. did try to, you know, help out. But, but what does he say? He says the guys he saw these guys. They used to hang out at the Bing. Then I don't see them. Then I see them with guys with beards and beards and headgear. He didn't but really he see anything. The fundamentalists. He saw them with those guys. They, they weren't. But doing that doesn't anything. mean. It doesn't mean they're fundamentalists. No. It just means they're devout. They might not be, you know. I understand, but he saw them in the bottom being being regular guys, and now he saw this. So he's just saying maybe there's something there. He's reaching. He doesn't know nothing. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, And then they give the phone number. uh, He gives Ahmed Ahmed and Muhammad's phone number, 973-555-0146. For people that don't know out there, it's always 555. That's the fake number. So whatever you see right on TV, uh, they never have a real phone number. It's always 555. Because that, you know, because then people will call the number or whatever. And So it's always, you know, 212, 555, you know, whatever it is. And, you know, if people wonder, those aren't real phone numbers. It's just 555. Otherwise, you put a real phone number up there, you'll torture the person to death, you know? Right. Isn't that what happened with like the- for, uh, put give give the audience your phone number and see what happens. Watch. <laughs> Just as an experiment. See I've, what already, happens. I've already I've already I bet some people would call you. I bet some of the fans would call you. Listen Steve. to me. Uh-huh. I already got enough jack offs calling me. I don't need more people. Uh you know, I was earlier I, I don't know if we were doing the podcast yet, but I was at my house in California. And I was trying to, on Twitter, you know, I'm fucking useless, you know, that technical te- technology. And I, I messaged somebody my phone number on Twitter, you know, you know, per DM, whatever you call it. And it must have, uh, wasn't private. And I'm getting fucking phone calls on my phone from people. Are you okay? Are you okay? I said, the girl called me from London. I said, yeah, I'm okay. I just want to make sure you put your phone number out there. I'm scrambling. I got about 25 calls. Oh, that's no good. No, and I'm fucking in a panic. And I called my daughter. Did you delete it? Yeah, and she fixed it. And, and, you know. (laughs) Hey, listen, I'm happy to talk to the fans. As long as they're nice, I don't have a problem. Yeah, but you don't want them calling you on your phone. I talk to civilians. I'm not like you. I talk to regular people. On the street, I do all the time, but not on the phone. I don't want people calling me. You don't like talking on the phone that much. No. You're not that big a phone. I'm a phone guy. You're not. No, no, I'm not a phone guy. Also, I like, I, that's why I like text. If I text, it takes me forever to fucking text. That's why when you text me, I always say, just call me. Because I can't have a conversation texting. I got to do because one you have time. a flip phone. That's why you got to get a smartphone. Like right now, yeah, Michael. I don't say how you doing. I go call me. Yeah, but you got a flip phone. If you had a, if you had a, uh, you know, something of the modern technological age, you could text much easier than I that don't thing that do you that. carry. You also don't want to email. You know, you email for information. If you want to go, how are things? How's the family? How they call me, and I'll tell you. I'm not a twelve year old girl texting. I'm a fucking grown ass old man. Twelve year old yes, girls sex, not grown men. Okay, twelve year old girls and fifty five year old guys as well. They text too. Uh, construction site. Here's another thing you don't do. AJ walks with Blanca. All right, uh, how you doing? Ba ba ba. There's a construction worker there. He's talking to her. He's laughing. Uh, and he goes, what are you going out with him? AJ's jealous. She's talking to a guy at work. 
And uh, AJ says, well, meeting me for coffee, it's not such a big deal. Uh, I don't even think it's a good idea anyway. Last time you started crying, we had to leave Starbucks. He breaks down crying. He hugs her. I love you so much. Listen, guys and girls out there, listen to Uncle Steve. When you break up, you break up. There's no, we're going to be friends. There's no, let's play. Part amicably, if one person doesn't want to break up, don't fucking hang around with them. You're going to feel worse and worse and worse. Well, that's what happens here. And then she says it happened in Starbucks. I guess they met at Starbucks. She was crying in Starbucks. He's hugging her. He's embarrassed. It's just awful. It's just she doesn't want to be with him. You know, it's just terrible. And, you know, you say, well, I could be friends. Listen, I'm not saying being enemies. He's heartbroken. The more he hangs around with her, the less he's going to get over this fucking thing. You got to cut it clean, man. Don't you agree? A hundred percent. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Good advice, you know, Steve. Say that again. Good advice. Good advice, Steve. No, but seriously. I mean, this is something. I'm serious. I think it's good advice. You know what's the worst thing? You, you tell the girl, you tell the girl, I love you. She says, I, I don't love you, but I'm in, I'm not in love with you, but I love you. But I'm not in love with you. That's horrendous. It's mean. That's mean. Yeah. That means get out. Yeah. Just get the fuck out. He should never see her again. Lick your wounds. Try to get back out there on the bicycle. And fucking time will, you know, will help. What right? bicycle? You know what I'm saying. It was a metaphor. Get oh, oh. <laughs> fucking smart ass. Now you're going to be talking. I don't know what you're talking about. Get back on the bicycle? What do you mean? Uh, uh, bada bing, Tony's talking to Lori, a uh, stripper. That's not Natalie cool. Walker. She was in. Uh, she was the stripper that he drove home. Oh, is that she, the same girl? She went down on him. He gave her some money, drove her home. That's the same stripper, Natalie Walker. Uh, the song playing there, if you've never heard this song, you should immediately go listen to it. It's by Hot Chocolate. It's called Emma. It's written by Errol Brown and Tony Wilson. Uh, Hot Chocolate were fin a fantastic band. I think their most famous song was You Sexy Thing. They have a lot of great songs. This is a really good one. It's about an aspiring actress. It's a very, it's a very tragic song. And it's about a suicide, but it is just awesome. So if you don't know it, listen to the whole thing because it's great. Uh, Laurie says, a man with a plan, a man with the erection. And then he gets a call from Carmela. I need you to come home. It's AJ. I'm worried, Tony. And he is just... Like, what the fuck? He said he had plans to go home with Lori and screw around, and now they are, uh, he's got to go home. His wife calls, and uh, AJ's laying in the bed, in AJ's bedroom. Tony arrives. What's the matter? Blanca still. I'm fucking depressed. He doesn't want to talk, AJ. You know, go, leave, go away. Uh, you broke up. How long you want to cry about it? She was my life. You're 20 years old. You barely have a life. You're better off anyway. Uh, you know, and then he mentions this. She was cute, but come on, with another guy's kid to boot. Yeah, and he says enough is enough. Is enough. You know, this you got to get over it. He says the best thing that ever happened to me. He says it happens. Everyone gets the blues. The music business is dedicated to that. I know it feels like you're never going to love again, but there's millions of girls out there. And then he says... Plus, you're white. That you're handsome, you're smart, and you're white. That's a huge. I don't know plus. what that means. I don't understand what that. Means. Well, because she's not. I guess he's saying. Oh, okay. He's better. Um, he's okay, he's better than her because of that. I guess that's what he's saying there, which is it's kind of weird and awful. Um, and then he says, "Go get a blowjob." Um, and then he's like, "Who's that's listening?" That's good advice. That's good advice. And he's like, who's listening? You know, watch watch what you say. Why? Who's listening? And he realized Carmela's out there, and he flips out. And she was alone. listening. She was listening. She was. Outside yeah. the door, which was not, which is wrong. Well, what's the fuck she's listening for? Uh, he mentions a couple of songs, Tears on My Pillow, Mona Lisa, Sad Songs. Uh, sad songs could get you in a funk. You go on they YouTube. Will. 
You go on YouTube, you put in sad songs, you listen to that, you get into a funk. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and then he says, leave me alone. Uh, Carmela says, I was glad when they broke up because of the culture divide. Unbelievable. So with all her, you know, religious shit, she still, you know, got her own issues. But now this is worse. And Tony says something that's very, it's a very Sopranos thematic statement concept. Everything turns to shit. That's what he feels. In some ways, that's what this season's about in he a weird way. meaning that their relationship, their, their, his engagement turned to shit. AJ. Well, he's saying everything turns to shit. He's basically saying, you know, it's like. Well, it's not the first time he said that. No, but it's kind of like what Terry was saying, you know, how, uh, you know, he's dissatisfied with his family life. His kids aren't where they were at. The, the You know, the job isn't where he's at. He's, you know, it's like this dissatisfaction, you know, has reached big proportions in this last season. Uh, Christopher's house, uh, the Soprano hallway, Tony and Carmella talk, right? Uh, then we, we head out to Christopher's house, Christopher and Kelly. I'm having a party, right? Uh, it's it just seems like Christopher's trying to be something he's not like he he feels like he wants this and this is what he should be doing, but it just to me it just I don't know it just he's, he's just not house. it's Kelly's idea she's nervous cooking for everybody that's a lot of pressure a lot of people he's got the Bacalas he's got Tony Carmela he's got Tom and Barbara. He's got uh, Kelly's family. It's a lot of people. A lot of people there. A lot of pressure. This is her first time doing it, right? Uh, she's never cooked for so many people. Uh, Christopher comes out. He's going to do the grilling. You know, that's Tony Soprano's specialty. He's watching Bobby and Tony talk business. Doesn't seem like, you know, he's not involved in that. Christopher doesn't, that doesn't make him too happy, it looks like. Uh, and then Tony comes over. He's giving him pointers. It's funny because he keeps saying, turn this steak. The rib is done. The, the, you know, he's giving him grilling pointers while they're talking. Christopher's having a non-alcoholic beer, which you like. You enjoy. Uh, well, I, you know, re in recent times, they figured out how to make them because they used to suck. Non-alcoholic beer used to just be fucking awful because the process, apparently they used to just heat it to burn out the alcohol. So they make regular beer, boil it or whatever the fuck, and boil out the alcohol, but it would taste like crap. And the body, the body of it was like just not right. Now I guess there's some new process. Heineken makes double zero. That's it's like you would you can't tell that you're drinking non-alcoholic you know one of our favorite restaurants Layla our friend Murat he owns Layla on uh, 74th Street great restaurant the west great. side they have a Turkish non-alcoholic beer that's awesome I forget the name of it but it's really good really and Be Bex makes a good one too so now you can get non-alcoholic beer that's delicious and you're not missing it I mean I used to drink uh you know when we were doing the Sopranos Sometimes we drink it in the scene, you know, if you had to drink beer yeah. in a glass. Uh, and it was just god awful after, crap. Aftertaste. Aftertaste uh, and kind of flat and like it would make it kind of gassy. What? Non alcoholic wine? I know they have that. Yeah, that, that ain't so good. Never tried that. You tried uh, it? I've tried it, but it doesn't, I don't think they've got that right yet. There's a store in Manhattan, forgot the name of it. The whole store is non-alcoholic spirits, not just beer and wine, Prosecco, champagne, non-alcoholic gin, scotch, whiskey, all that. The whole store is dedicated to that. It's on the east side. It's on, I think it's on Madison Avenue. But, the Turkish uh, non-alcoholic beer is called FS e -E or EFES, E-F-E-S. But this store is really cool. I wonder what non-alcoholic vodka tastes like. I don't know if they have that. That's a good question because it's probably would taste like water. But water, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But they have all kinds of, uh, you know, because like you don't always want to. Sometimes you feel, why do you drink it on alcoholic beer? Well, sometimes like if you're having, 
you know, a certain type of food, like sushi or something. You don't want just the water. You don't want something sweet. Yeah. I don't always want soda. I've That's kind of nice. I've tasted yeah. uh, the non-alcoholic beer. It's okay. And you know, I've tasted that. So Tony comes over. He makes a, makes a joke. Non-alcoholic beer. This filling tastes like ass. He's mocking him for not drinking. Uh, you know, he's giving him the grilling tips. Uh, and, he, and Christopher says, you know, you should understand how hard it is the human condition. It's a disease. I inherited it from my mother. And he doesn't believe in that it's a disease. As a lot of people don't believe it's a disease. Uh, and then he hits him with, let's be honest about the great Dickie Maltesante. My dad, your hero, wasn't much more than a fucking junkie. Say so he did coke, drank vodka, he shoves stuff up in his arm. But, I mean, now we have the Many Saints in Newark, which features Dicka Moltisanti, and that doesn't seem to be a, a an no. issue at all with him. Yeah, but, but this is just a small period of, we don't see him over a span of 10 years. So maybe Yeah, after- but it, does, it just does not seem to be part of his personality. He seems like or- somebody who kind of has it. He had his shit together, together and in control. Yeah, I agree with you. Some ways. But maybe, like I said, people go through things. You know, you know, people go through things. You know, if you if you're looking at them for ten years, you know, maybe for two years he was fucked up and then he was okay, you know. Maybe, you know, I don't know. You know, I, I don't know. You know, I hear what you're saying. Well, uh, he also he says he did a lot of coke. You know, he died in the early seventies. I don't know how much coke were people doing there. How much like, gangsters in Jersey were they doing a lot of coke in the late sixties, early seventies? Probably not. Not in the early seventies, but in the late seventies, mid right, to but late. But Dicky died in the early seventies. Yeah. They're saying right. Um, Christopher says something funny uh, about Kelly. She's getting her teeth wet with entertaining, which is a you know either you get your feet wet or you cut your teeth. <laughs> trying something new. He says she's getting her teeth wet. It's a very subtle but funny line. Tony says, I, we never see you you're like a ghost. And then he says how hard, it's hard to be around the Bing because of the strippers, they're cokeheads. It's hard to be around Satrials because of the fridge full of beer. Um, and Tony doesn't have a lot of sympathy for him. You know, Tony doesn't. gives him some uh, analogy of, you know, I can't eat eggplant, so I just stop, you know, Two different things here, you know. I can't eat eggplant because it'll fuck up my stomach. Well, you know, because he got shot. It does say no. He's basically saying, you know, you, you know, you, you know, you could drink. You know, you could still come around and not drink. Yeah, I mean, he's a. Uh, I mean, and he's somebody who's. Listen, I, does he think depression's a disease? He treats it like such. You think uh, alcoholism is a disease? I mean, it's it's how you. um, It depends on how you define the word disease. Is it behavioral? Can you stop? Is it? I don't think it. it, You know, I'll be honest with you. I don't think it matters. What it is is how are you going to deal with it? What you know? uh, I think the important thing is not uh, why people talk about it as a disease is because. Usually they brand you as somebody of, you know, it's a moral failing or a weakness, which is not the case. There is something, you know, could happen to anybody. He's a pe- sometimes are people who function at the highest levels, but they're, you know. But uh, I, they, I'll they, tell you he, this, though. This is something uh, that bothers me. And I have a friend of mine whose wife was an alcoholic and a horrible alcoholic and uh, horrible behavior. You know, horrible baby. But that was always the out. Well, it's a disease. So what? She gets a fucking pass? She gets a pass for acting and bothering people and, and ruining people's parties and weddings and, and No, the and, point of the point of calling it a disease is not to like excuse drunken behavior. It's to help the recovery process. I understand that, but a lot of people use that, hey, it's a disease. What do you want her to do? Like she has no control. It's not cancer. That you don't have control of. Well, know? what do you want to do? Go get help. Go to AA. Go to rehab. Go to a psychiatrist. My That's point. what you wanted to do. But do you know what I'm saying? You've heard that before. I haven't heard that as like just giving up and like not, not you know, you say get help. I mean, it's like, listen, I you, you, we have friends that deal with that shit. And it's like, 
until you get uh, listen you, you can't talk about other problems in your life if that's an issue you know it's like i can't hold a job i can't hold a relationship i'm depressed well if you're you know have substance abuse problems you can't fix any of that shit until you take care of that you can, you know it's like don't tell me about your relationships problems if you're an active drug addict well there you go you that know? supersedes all other problems of course how can you, you know, if that's your addiction, you know, if, if you're in the grips of, you know, addiction like that and active, like, how can you be, you know, it's hard to be, people are functional, but some shit's going to go by the wayside. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Al's Hardware Store, Jason Little Pauly, packed their van with power saws. Al arrives, points a gun at them. He has a silent alarm. It goes off at his house. It's a good scene here. Uh, and Paul, little Paulie plays it off. My uncle didn't call you. He's it for his friend at the union. You know, he's bullshitting. It's a mix up. I thought Paulie called you. He's going to call, uh, Al's going to call Christopher. He says, if I were you, I won't make a problem where there ain't any. He's giving him a veiled threat. They're lying. They're stealing Al's shit, which is just amazing that they would fuck around with Christopher's father in law. Yeah, it is amazing. It's a bad move. It's very disrespectful. disrespectful. It's, very um, disrespectful. But they just feel like it's, uh, you know, he, yeah. he would have got it from Chris anyway, so he's just doing it directly. But it's horrible. They're breaking into the guy's store when he could have, you know, Paulie should have went to Chris and said, I need this. Give it to me. Of course. Pizza shop. AJ's working. He sees a couple kissing. Uh, you know, he hands his apron. He starts crying. He gives it to take over Felix. I'm going home. It's very funny. Felix that guy is, is Mondo Alvarado, who's actually a, an award-winning and very prolific playwright and filmmaker. Really? The guy plays the uh, Felix. And he's very good. Scene. Very good. It's no. a small scene, but very good. AJ quits. He says, uh, tell him I'm sorry. And he walks out crying, hysterical. I mean, he is in bad shape. He's very fragile, this kid. You know, she... You know, she's also older, more experienced uh, uh, every which way. Beautiful girl. She rocked his world. She rocked his world. Yeah, without a doubt. And and um, I mean, my thing is that she felt he was just immature. And, and you know, she's, she's used to she wants someone in her life that's, you know, going to be more more mature, you know, take care of her and her kid. You know, that's what she wants. Uh, by the big Patsy meets with Tony. Uh, he's telling him, uh, you know, my kids are running a bookmaking thing in college. First, I didn't want him to go. I was against him going to college, but he could stay as long as he want. So they're kicking up to him, and he's kicking up to Tony. Patsy talks about his kids, their kids, Carlo's kid and uh, Patsy's Two kids are in college. They're taking action. Two Jasons, they seem like regular kids, kind of spoiled also. They know their father's a wise guy. So they're, they're frat boy, you know, that scene, you know. Uh, you know, the younger one. Uh, and, and, and Tony sees these are like two regular kids, two regular college kids doing what they're supposed to be doing, getting drunk, chasing girls. You know, uh, Tony talks to him. He's at the bar. They're looking at the strippers. You know, he's uh, saying, hey, you know, invite my son. You know, invite AJ, my son. You guys, you know, he broke up with that girl. Call AJ. He'd love to see you guys. He's kind of pushing it a little. Tony in his head is going, why can't AJ be more like these two? Right. You know, you know, it's funny. Both of them are named Jason. And there's another Jason who was in the scene with Paulie. Uh, little Paulie that playing Jason Molinari. That's uh, uh, Willie DeMeo. Willie DeMeo. It's three uh, Jasons in this episode. Uh, Jason Parisi is Michael Drea, a really good actor. Joe Perino, he did a, a Blue Bloods, really good actor. Both of them, nice guys, good actors. Uh, and he's, you know, you know, he's saying, "I wish my kid could be more like this." What the fuck here? Uh, Paulie's apartment. Christopher arrives. Great scene. Christopher barges in, they busted into a store, his acid reflux is acting up. That's one of those little soprano things out of nowhere. Doesn't mean anything. He woke up Kelly. Uh, Paulie, it's my fault. Your father-in-law's a crybaby. They were there to boost. Which is, what car. does that even mean? 
Of course, he's a good guy. Broke into his store, took his shit. You know, Paulie <laughs> thinks it's his stuff. You know, you know, pa- fucking Paulie. He's a lunatic. Paulie, uh, you know, and he yells. He says, uh, "When you suck the money out of my ass, get the fuck out." Christopher looks at him sideways. Yeah, he's not happy. When are you going to pay me? And he says, never. Paulie yells at him. By the big back room, Tony, Silvio, and Paulie are at the desk talking business. Christopher, I got to talk to you. Urgent. Uh, That fucking Paulie. And Tony doesn't want to listen. And Bobby asks him, what's up? Christopher doesn't like that at all. Bobby doesn't. Sticks his nose where it doesn't belong there a little bit. But like I said, he's kind of dropped down, Christopher. He's not. The he's on the outs, yeah. And these guys are talking big money. They're talking medical MRIs and whatever kind of scams. And Christopher's just, you know, he's on the outs. He's just not, he's not, his head is not in this anymore. And you he know, says, okay. you know, what happened? He says, it ain't about the money. And Tony's like, oh, well, we, it is about the money with us. It's a million dollar deal. You're talking about a pallet of drills. Go get a lime Ricky. You know, basically saying that Christopher's personal problems are not important. Well, I don't know if this has the urgency. You know, listen, we all think our problems are, I need to, I'm guilty of that all the time. That's you know, the whole show. The Sopranos is like that all the time. I mean, I'm guilty of that. It's not that big a deal, but I think it is. And I fucking get on the phone and fucking, you know what I mean? Sure. Yeah, it's, it's, it's important to Christopher. Soprano bedroom, Tony Carmella lay in bed. Uh, Meadow comes in. I need to talk to you guys. Not about me. AJ, he's upset. My friend at school in the dorm, she threw herself off the library balcony. Uh, And she was saying these exact things. You know, she's kind of giving them a heads up here. Yeah. And again, here's... um Here's where we start, you know, we're seeing a little bit of like the juxtaposition with Christopher and, and AJ, you know. Tony not caring about Christopher's problems and then dealing with his son and being there, you know, for his son. Um, he's saying disturbing things. Nobody gives a shit. What's the point? Um, and Tony goes down to be a father to his son. Uh, he goes, they're watching the movie Annapolis, uh, which is James Franco and your friend, uh, Donnie Wahlberg was in that movie, actually. Tyrese Gibson, 2006. The, this movie, and later on, he's watching a day, watching John Wayne. So very kind of masculine, you know, I, I, iconic kind of. Uh, Are you a John of, Wayne fan? You know, I wasn't for a long time, but I do like. Um, I think he was probably a horrible human being. Like he said some sh- some shit that is yeah. just fucking disgusting. Um I liked him in the Cowboys, uh, w- w- uh, which my friend Roscoe Lee Brown was in with him. I think that's a really good movie. Um, I like The Searchers a lot. I think he's good in that. I mean, and uh, True Grit, he's really good. You know, uh, you know what he gave me a book? You know, he has a whiskey out, a whiskey brand, John Wayne. And a friend of mine sent me a bottle of his whiskey, which I don't drink, and, and, and a book. And in the book, it's a lot of his personal stuff, a copy of his driver's license. It's kind of a, you know, it's a big picture book, like a coffee table book. So, you know, I put the computer on. I need a couple of books to prop it up. So I just use the book to prop up the fucking computer and take a My wife takes a picture. I put it out there. People are going, John Wayne, he sucks. He's a ra-. Yeah, I know that. I'm just using the book to fucking prop up the computer, man. Does it mean I'm a John Wayne fan? You know, he was, it comes out years later, he was a racist. A very big white, racist. A white supremacist, yeah. Very he was much an awful. Old. And they've talked, he, there's been talk about his, uh, the, 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 the airport. airport. In Orange County named after him, John Wayne Airport. They're going to take his name off it all. We're, we're thinking about it, you know, but I just used the book kind of like as a fucking prop. It's like, Come on. They should call it the Steve Sharippa Airport. You live down there. Fucking right. Fucking right. I'm not a racist. Fucking right they should. God damn it. I'm going to I'm gonna spearhead this campaign. When I die, come on. Take care of that for me, would you? Come on. You got it, Steve. 
You got a few things you got. Listen, we got to put our differences aside for the podcast. I, you need to take care of a few things for me when I'm gone. All right? I know. Oh, I know. I'm well aware. <laughs> Melfi's office. Uh, I came in here to tell you in all seriousness that I'm done. Therapy's a jerk off. You know He's staring at the statue from the first, very first episode, which is how this whole show started with that. Anyway, yeah. I was coming here to quit. I had it all planned out, but guess what? My son's talking suicide. So I, now I'm trapped here forever. What is Melfi's last episode? I don't remember. Uh, Blue Comet, number 12. Blue Comet, okay. Uh, number, number eight, I'm sorry, number eight. Next to last one. Melfi, would you like me to recommend someone? What, like the incompetent you sent metal to? Remember that? She sent a, she sent metal to a bad therapist. Played by Linda Lavin. It's making things worse. Uh, you know, friends of mine have sons his age, and they're happy, ambitious. My son's curled up on the couch in the fetus position. In the fetus position. Yeah. Where he should be banging Fetal. co-eds. I'm prone to depression. A, I have a certain bleak attitude towards the world. He's got miserable existence. It's in it's in his blood. Rotten putrid genes has infected his soul. That's my gift. I hate this fucking shit. After all the complaining, crying, and all the BS, is this all there is? Again, that's the theme of the show in a nutshell, in some ways. The whole show. You know, well, I don't know. Satisfaction. Therapy, therapy is what you get out of it, what you put in it. You know, he he thinks that they're going to have the answers to fix everything, and I don't. I, I I'm not a big therapy person, but I don't think that's how it works. Are you a small therapy person? Well, I told you, I try every thing that every sponsor that we have, I've tried it, so I've called Better Help. But before this podcast, were you in therapy? Never. Never, ever. I, I don't think I need therapy. I'm, I'm, I'm just fine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know what I would talk about. What would I talk about? Why, do, why am I angry? Why does everything fucking annoy me? Why do people fucking break my balls? What, what do I talk about? Exactly that, maybe. You know, like the day, like this uh, yesterday. I'm waiting to get picked up from work. Fucking jerk off in my building comes around the corner. I'm coming off the elevator. He's got like a scooter. He don't say fucking excuse me. I wanted to get what him to fucking put his neck against the wall. What he did he do? He came around the corner fast. I almost in the building. Hit me. In the building. Then I'm waiting outside, and here comes a guy, slams the door to go outside. Jerk offs. Rude. Well, yeah, inconsiderate. Very much so. I say, excuse me. I'm sorry. If something happened, I, I apologize. I have no problem. Now, do you think, like, see, I think, like, being inconsiderate should be, like, there should be, like, consequences. Like, you know, like, douchebags who blast their cell phones on the subway, like, like sure. everyone needs to listen to their whatever the fuck they're watching or listening to, like that kind of shit or um a lot of stuff. Not picking up after your dog. I think I think a lot of people also are looking for beefs, you know, Michael? They're like daring you to say something. They want to provoke. Some people do. So. Some I people mean, are just clueless and inconsiderate. Don't give a shit. I'm getting on the elevator and she's talking with earbuds in, fucking loud. Blah 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 blah. You know, go the fuck, go to the other side, go outside where there's nobody. I don't talk on my cell phone like that. But it's not just that. There's a million fucking things, a million things. People, not everyone, a lot of rude motherfuckers. Yeah, no a lot. A lot of rude. And a lot of people with money think who the fuck they are, you know. A lot of people that have money, you know, they, they, they really think, they're elitists. They really think they're better than everyone else. I hate when people, you know, uh, play shit on their phones, like when you're either in a, on the plane or in the train or whatever like that. I mean, that's like, what's that about? Like, you just 
clueless to everybody else who's there. And what's the thing about like having you're in public and you have to have your phone on speaker and people have to hear both sides of your conversation. What's that about? Or in a plane before you take off, like these fucking businessmen, blah, blah, blah. Like they're such fucking hot shots. What the fuck are you, you fucking jackass? I agree with you, Steve. I really do. Yeah. Well, we should do something about it. What do we want to do? Get names? I don't know. Maybe, you know, Get maybe. Get names to call them out on the podcast? So-and-so from fucking Westchester is a fucking cocksucker. This person in apartment 12B is a motherfucking asshole. And I give the address. Yeah. You want to start doing that? Calling them out? Get license place numbers? This guy, this girl was texting on the fucking highway when I was next to her. Yeah, that's good. Start calling them out? We'll become that's professional snitches. Talking Soprano, professional snitch company. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> no, I, I, you know. How about a waiter? How about when a waiter's pissed off at you and they come and they, look, they drop the, the, the plate down like they're mad. What are you mad at me for? They drop the plate like, and you don't want to say nothing because then it's going to ruin your dinner. You know, you're going to get, you're going to get a beef. I'm going to then ruin my fucking night out here. So you, yeah. you, you let it go, you let it go. But Yeah, I was at a restaurant. I forget. I think it was in Florida, you know, and it's like the, the staff kind of feels like you're, it's a privilege for you to be there to eat because sure. everyone wants to go there. So they throw the menus down. They're in a rush. Yeah. They throw up, the, you know, it's like, I'm sorry. Yeah. I don't give a shit what you're serving here. Absolutely. I don't, you know. Fucking hostess. The rude, rude hostess or host. Fucking rude. You know. Of course, it's the hot restaurant now. You know how it goes. They want certain people in there, people that look a certain way. They'll put them up front so the restaurant looks like, you know, especially, you know, New York, L.A., they're all about that fucking nonsense, you know. Some places. not. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, of course, not everyone. Uh, I'm not talking every place. I'm talking there are these fucking places. Fuck it. Uh, so that's it. He, Tony's saying it's a big jerk off. I, I hate this shit. Uh, it's said and done. All the complaining, the crying. And uh, Peggy Lee, a great song. Is this all there is? You ever hear that? You like Peggy Lee? I do, yeah. Is that all there is, right? Is that all there is. Great song. She does a great uh, I'll Be Seeing You. Yeah. That's really what my good wife says that. all the time. Is that all there is? That's it, honey. That's all I got. That is all there is. That's all there is. Is that it? Our wedding night. Is that all there is? That's it. For 32 years, she's saying. Is that all there is? That's it. Sorry. <laughs> but the key is to be happy with what's it, what it is, and then you're okay. Uh, hey, like you say, what do you need? You need a sandwich? Couple of good friends, couple of drinks, a good sandwich, take care of my family. That's all you I, need is a sandwich. I'm said very that. simple. And not Subway. Not Subway sandwiches. They got all kinds. Of, you know, at one point, they were accused of putting the same material in their bread as rubber. rubber. And then now there's a big controversy. Their tuna sandwich they're saying it's not real tuna in the tuna sandwich. There's no what is tuna. It? What is it? I don't know. All kinds of fish with tuna. So wow. I'm not. Uh, that's it. When I say I, I don't go to those places. No, me neither. There's so many good places here in New York. Uh, Pristillo is one of the best sandwiches you'll ever have. Leone, great sandwich. That's all I need, Michael. I'm a simple man. Simple man. With simple yes. words, that's all I... You've said, said that many times. I could live in a tent. I could live in a tent on a, on a blow-up bed. What are you talking about, live in a tent? <laughs> live uh, in a tent. AA, AA meeting, Christopher shares. Uh, I'm Christopher, I'm an alcoholic drug addict, my boss. So what is, is Christopher coming off like he's a salesman? What do they think Christopher does for a living? I guess he's saying he's a salesman. He obviously can't talk about what he really does. Seems a little bit not accurate, I must say, uh, to AA. You're not 
supposed to cross talk in AA, which means Christopher says, I want to go back to what Stan said about not being able to socialize. You're not allowed to do that. You're not, well, you're not supposed to do that. I'm, if you say something in an AA meeting, unless you're the speaker, so usually in AA they'll have a speaker, they'll talk for 15, 20 minutes. You can refer to this, the speaker's story. But if you're just sharing, I'm not supposed to refer to your share. You're supposed to talk, and I talk. Up. i supposed to keep the focus on me. This guy, Stan, played by Greg Connolly, who we know is a friend of ours, um, Greg interrupts Connolly, Christopher. Andrew he Con- interrupts Christopher, and, and you never do that in AA. That's wrong. So this scene's a little bit not, not as accurate as it um it's it's not exactly how it is in AA. I guess it's for dramatic purposes they needed that kind of interplay and 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 exchange but uh you know you wouldn't do that. People would really get down on you and the moderator would say there's no crosstalk. Really? Uh, you know I knew a comic that used to go to AA to get stage time. He would tell jokes. That's pathetic. Is what that is. He would tell jokes. He would get up there and, uh, you know, say, I'm blah, 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 and I'm an alcoholic. And I mean, that is time. just fucking pathetic. That jokes. is so sad, I can't even begin to say. Uh, and then they meet, they're in the, the, the they're having a cigarette in the uh, stairwell. Chris makes an enabler, the worst fucking kind, pours you a drink on one hand, judges you with the other. If you take it, you know. And I love they, uh, Christopher says, if I sat with him, I'd get much more money and responsibility if I sat drinking with him, watching that scotch drool out of his fat fucking mouth. <laughs> you know, and, and Stan is saying, you know, the same thing. The golf outing, they get drunk. You know, it's the good old boy syndrome, right? They go out sure. after work, you get drunk, you get, you know, blah, 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 right? They do shop talk. There's nothing worse than shop talk. Nothing worse. You know, here's what I was talking about with these intercutting, because you have Christopher at AA, then it cuts to uh, the Soprano house, AJ's watching TV, Tony comes down and wants him to put on John Wayne, that's Hellfighters in 1968, another kind of macho movie, he plays a, obviously a firefighter, and he tells him about Jason's party, I don't know if I want to go, uh, I hate that shit, beer and strippers, and he's kind of Lays down the law and says, no, you're going to go. You're going to shower, shave, get dressed, and go. No debate. And AJ says, fine, which is a little surprising. And then we cut back to AA, this time in the stairwell. I think the point is really to show, and there was another episode like this. I think it was uh, Fortunate Son where kind of a similar theme, you know, went on here. Uh, you and know, he-, he says, I have a happy marriage. We used to be so tight, but there was a woman we were. He's getting close to talking, saying I shit. I sided with him. She was out of my life. Okay, fine. He never appreciated it. Give, give, give. It's all I ever do. Relationship got poisoned. stranger. Yeah. Stan is a stranger. Not good. He does a good job, Greg Connolly. He's a good guy, a friend of ours for a long time, and... Uh, uh, and this has gone south. Their relationship has gone, uh, has really gone south. You know, he yeah. once thought of Christopher as a son. And as an heir apparent, kind of. You know, yeah. he tried to really? kind of really put a lot of the future in him, and that's all done. Good Goodbye. Sure. Hardware store. Hardware store. Al gets in his car. Little Paulie and Jason are watching. They lie to the old man, Mike. Uh, there's more drills in the back. They fake calling out. Uh, you know, these fucking guys are not, they're out of line here. They are out of line. Uh, little Paulie, Jason, enter. You know, uh, I know what you mean. Al didn't say nothing about picking anything up. Uh, he pretends to leave Al a voicemail. Great writing in the scene. The, the, the way they lie, the way they pretend, the way they get it over. I, I love, I love how this is. Uh, how it's really, it's really Willie good. DeMeo, uh, and uh, uh, Carl Capitotto who plays Little Paul. He does a really good job here. Yeah. Then AJ uh, is going to see Doctor Vogel, and he's played said, by Michael Countryman. And he gets right um, to it. Have you been feeling suicidal, Anthony? A little bit. You know. Uh, he explains uh, 
Lanka broke up with her. Maybe it's because of family. She comes from immigrants, which makes no sense. He says there's no reason, but maybe it's because we have way more money and it scared her. Which I don't think is the case. I That's think it's that she just hey, listen, felt he was immature. When you're with yeah. somebody, you either care for them or you don't. Right? It's yeah, like, and if you care for them, you want to make it work. That's it. There's certain right. things you want to make it work. Just like a girl, well, he didn't call. He's got this. They have uh, commitment issues, all the bullshit. You know, a guy says it, a girl says it. If he wants to be with you, if she wants to be with you, they'll find a way to be with you. End of the fucking story. Stop the, let's cut all the bullshit away, which there's a lot of bullshit, and let's just get right to it. Just like a long yes. distance relationship. Yes. You know, you exactly. can make it work, you know, if you want. Not if you're on the other side of the world, but you know what I'm saying. He suggests putting him on Lexapro, the doctor suggests for AJ, for depression. It's also for kleptomania, body dysmorphia, and OCD. So kleptomania. So you steal things without even knowing you're stealing them? Is that clear? No, you you just you steal stuff uh, because you have to. You you have know, you to. Don't have co- it's even not that you don't know it, you just do it. Uh, it becomes a compulsion. So even if it's like, uh, what was it on Seinfeld? Uncle, uh, remember the uncle? Jerry's uncle? He stole Oh, stuff. yeah. Uncle Leo, I think he, well... He said he did it because he was old and he thought he could get over. But um, people have that as like a, it's like a mental disorder where I you're just, feel. you don't have to, you know, you can buy, as some people with money do it. You can buy whatever you need. Sure. Of course they do. But you feel a compulsion that you can't, you know, like it's like an addiction almost. You can't control it. I don't steal anything. I never steal no, no, I don't steal. I, I did when I was young. I don't anymore. Everyone, I think, has the one yeah. young, but I don't. I, I haven't. I don't steal anything. I don't want. I don't want any uh, bootleg movies. I don't want free cable. I don't want the fire stick. I don't want nothing. I'll pay for. No, what I, I don't take anything that doesn't belong to me. That's it. I don't want nothing for free. What's the saying I told you? No free lunch. And I don't want nothing for free. I can't afford it. Oh, that's a good one. Did you coin that phrase? I did not coin it. Did you coin no free lunch? No. But I use it a lot. And it's no no truer words have been spoken. And no good deed goes unpunished. No truer words. We're all guilty of that. I'm sure you are. You've helped many a person. And they turn around and fuck you. Yes, but helping people is its own reward, Steve. Well, listen, I've helped a lot of people, and I'm happy to do it. There I just you go. I want them to turn around and screw me. I've helped a ton of people. Sometimes it just don't work out. Sometimes it doesn't, no. Like, look at Andy. Look at fucking Andy. He's a bully now. You know, he, he turned around. He became a fucking bully. He, he, Fame will do that to you. He beats us up fucking verbally, Andy. Beats us up. He's, he's got the Verderettes, his fan club. They, they, yeah. you know, got a little distorted taste. his worldview. Got a little taste of fucking, a little taste of celebrity, and he went fucking hog wild, this guy. I've seen it before. I've seen it with uh, other actors. Suddenly they became, you know, a little notable, and they just go off the fucking rails. It you happens. know people. You know people like that. Well, yeah, it'll do. That'll, that'll happen, sure. Uh, bada bing, back room. AJ talks to Jason. Uh, I'm making mad fucking money too. Uh, AJ, I'm not really good with betting and percentages. I got 450 on my math SAT. AJ gets a lap dance. I All love it. Guys. She said, "Can I dance for you?" He says, "Yeah, I guess." It's hilarious. All these it's guys are hilarious. back there. They're all. Drunk and having fun and strippers. They're in the VIP room and they're enjoying themselves and he's not. Not at all. No, uh, and a bunch of scenes now be- cutting between AJ and Christopher and the difference, you know, 
uh, in their lives and in their relationship, you know, their, their father, father figure and result of having a father or not having a father. A lot of these things happen. Yeah, we cut to this apartment building. I think that's Williamsburg, Lorimer Street. Benny, Dante, uh, little Paulie playing cards. Christopher comes in. Great scene. Beats, great, him, great. beats him up and throws him out the window. Yeah, a great, really well edited scene because they really make the tension. Now, now how pop. did you do that? Tell me how you did that. Um, I think the. I think. Was it a real apartment? Or a studio. I don't think so. I don't remember. I don't. I don't. I think the stuntman just kind of went out the window, and then there was a dummy that flew out the window. You know, he just started to go out. I think it was shot in the studio. He starts to go out the window, and then they cut it with a dummy outside. It's a hilarious scene. I love Christopher. Focus starts hitting him. They can't say nothing. Christopher's a made guy. These he guys, are made guys, they can't say stop. They can't jump in. They can't do anything. Uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, little Paul, he's a jokester. He tells a bad joke to Benny. Benny, it's very funny, very dry. Benny says, what's that, comedy? <laughs> what's that, comedy? Max Casella, always fucking good. I love Max. Uh, and Chris is pissed, comes in. It's a great scene. He throws him out the window. He's lucky he didn't, God forbid, you know, fall on his head. But he's fucked up. That's a long way down. Long <laughs> way down, yeah, man. He could have died. Uh, soprano bedroom. Carmelo wakes Tony up, you, and she's telling him, "You let our underage son go to a party at a strip club. He got in three hours ago, and uh, he says, for Christ's sakes, he's going to be twenty-one in two months. I mean, what's her problem? What's a kid supposed to do?" Yeah, I mean, exactly. She's a little bit. And then she kind of realizes when he does say it, got him out of the house. They're college kids. They're frat boys, you know, better than him moping over, you know, the, the relationship. You want to see him he, in his room drinking cocoa. You know what annoys me? Another thing that annoys me about Carmela, you know, he says, what time is it? And she goes and opens the fucking curtains. So the sun comes in. Like that he should wake up because I hate what? that. My wife never does that. I hate that. No, no, no. I hate that too. Yeah. Um, yeah. It is weird that right. He could be die, you know, in the army and die in Iraq in a well, war, but he can't have a beer. It's kind of that's kind of a ridiculous. You can't have a beer. Is it worried about him a strip club? Even she should be encouraging that. So what? She should. She should. So what? And especially to get over this girl. Paulie's car, you see Paulie, he's pissed. He's driving, you know, very intense. Uh, oh, store. hilarious. His face is just fucking hilarious. Pork store, he's... back room, Tony and Christopher talk. He says, I did a stupid thing. I won't deny it. I just hung up with Paulie. His nephew got six broken vertebrae. Christopher's house, and he tears up the lawn. This beautiful lawn that we saw earlier Christopher talking on the stoop, and his uh, wife and baby were on a blanket in the front lawn. It's a beautiful, uh, beautiful lawn, beautifully landscaped, and uh, it cost a lot of money, and he just tears the shit out of it. And it's $40,000. It, it, it's scary. Kelly and the baby are in the window. You know, maybe she's going to crash right into the front door. She doesn't. Oh, yeah, yeah. Very scary. Uh, this is the second time Paulie Flott is a target of my face. It's my father-in-law we're talking about. It's my family. Uh, and Tony says, if you were around, this bullshit could have been handled with a conversation. And he says, yeah, I tried to talk to you, but that wasn't a good time to talk. They were doing business. And he says, like, if you flouted his authority is another kind of uh, misuse of words, because flout means disregard. He's not disregarding his authority. He's disregarding Christopher's, you know, disrespecting Christopher. But it's kind of funny. But if you were around more, if you had the finger, your finger on the pulse, we would have squashed this in the room. Well, he could have left me a message. And Tony's right. He says, what, are you going to leave phone messages about uh, interstate hijacking? What are we going to send, emails and faxes? This is a face-to-face -face business. And he's right. Yeah. Absolutely. Christopher's not around. 
this kind of shit, you know, if you're around more, you talk about it, you know, it comes up. Now you got to pay for the hospital bills. Uh, Christopher kind of feels Tony doesn't give a shit about him, basically, which is, is and isn't true. I think he's caring less and less about him. That's for sure. Christopher's house, Paulie's finished trashing the place, really trashes it and, and leaves. Uh, uh, you know, it goes back and forth. It, it, it's the way they did it is really good. Then uh, Christopher goes home, calls Tony in the car. He tore up my fucking lawn, drove his car right up. I love the way you delivered this. You were great in this episode, by the way. Uh, drove his fucking car right up in the grass. Just for you. I'm fucking relaxed. I'm not going to do nothing. I mean, the way he delivered it. Because I love you. You know, he's, he's very... Christopher is fucking pissed. I'm committed to my work. I'll sit tight and hold my tongue and not cause no problems for you. 40 grand in landscaping. A lot of money. A lot of money, yeah. A lot of money. I think, I got to be honest, uh, Tom, uh, Paulie is way out of line here. Well, Christopher threw his nephew out the window. No, no, no. From the beginning. With the power. From the beginning. Oh, totally. 100%. He's and he wrong. doesn't do that. He's out of fucking line here. Okay, AJ stands up. We're at the frat party. AJ stands with uh, Jason and Jason. Victor arrives. Victor's a guy who owes them money. He's gambling. So and now he wants them to give him a a thousand dollars at two and a half points. My father's sending my check this week. Spoil kid. The father sends money. This kid's gambling. He's in deep to Jason and Jason. Uh, and then he did. You know they. Yeah, if not, you see this guy right here? It's Tony Soprano Jr. Once again, they're using him like they did in the club. Tony Soprano, Tony Soprano, they're using that. We got muscle here. Even though he's a little guy, you know, this is Tony Soprano's son. All these kids know who Tony Soprano is. You know? They're, 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 these frat boys, they wouldn't be so tough. Uh, their fathers are all wise guys. So the two Jasons, you know, they, they, they're punks. I'll be honest. I sure. see them as punks here, you know? Sure, absolutely. You know, they're fucking daddy, you know. Well, they, uh, when I was young, when you had a, these kids used to drive around with Cadillacs. They used to call them Danilacs. They would drive around like half a wise guy in my neighborhood, wise guy's sons. They had their father's Cadillac and, you know, acted. They knew they could get away with it, you know. You know who my father is. You know who my uncle is. That still goes on to this day, you know, that bullshit, sure. you know. Uh, soprano Kitchen, Tony comes downstairs, Carmelo gives him coffee. Is he sleeping? He's not home. He stayed with his friend. She's happy. She smiles. He was playing cards, she said. It's a pleasure not to have him laying around like a miserable. Oh. Yeah, she's happy. You know, he's, he's out. He's got cards. friends. He's really playing cards. That's what, she, that's what she wants to believe. She, yeah, she wants to believe she doesn't really care. Bada Bing, Carlo talks to uh, uh, Anthony Walden. Benny. Walden is played by Frank John Hughes, who's done a lot of work. Uh, he was in Righteous work. Kill, Catch Me If You Can. He was on 24. So Walden, which is a weird name for an Italian guy, but it, where it comes from is uh, Bobby Darren's real name. Yeah. Was Walden Robert Casotto. Bobby Darren. Frank John Hughes is a... a, a Screenwriter, he's written a bunch of stuff. He's a jazz musician. I just uh, he just texted me the other day. He loves the podcast. Good actor, good fucking guy. This very guy. very good actor. And our buddy Johnny C. Johnny Johnny Chenatempo, he plays Anthony uh, Maffei in this scene. He's you know, there. Carlo comes in. Chris uh, tell goes to Tony. I call Salvicho, like you said, he's coming by this week. Christopher seems relaxed. He's going to resod the lawn. It's kind of sense of relief. He'll take care of it. Talk to Paulie. We worked out a payment schedule. So Paulie's going to pay for the loan that he did. He fucked up. He says, is he here? He's over there. Christopher, they apologized to each other. Seems like they patched things up. I remember when we shot this. Me too, yeah. One of the bottom big girls at B.O. Band. Really? Just so you know. Maybe I did too. Unless it was me. It's possible, but I don't know that bo. You've known Who me a did? long time. You ever know me that bo? 
I don't know if I'm ever that close to you. <laughs> and, and let's keep it that way. Yeah, let's keep it that way. Um, Mood Indigo by Keely Smith is playing during this scene. Yeah, uh, Christopher says, how's the little boy? He goes, he's fucked up, but he got your flowers, which is, he threw the guy out the fucking, you know, four-story window, okay. uh, got your flowers. The guys uh, talk about Walmart, uh, the ports, you know, Carlos is trying to explain the corporations. Silvio calls Chris the missing link. Yeah, Christopher gives him an envelope. Chris decides to have a drink to toast with Paulie, which is a big deal. He hasn't big been drinking. He says, fuck it. He's trying to figure out maybe this is better if he drink. You know, he's all confused. Uh, you know, it's it's a mistake, but he's thinking it's going to make life easier. It's a good times. They toast. Cut to AJ having a toast with his friends. Taking a shot. Making that connection between these two characters very clearly here. To go, cutting from one toast to another toast. Girl calls. is having a party. Victor, the guy that owes her money. They said, AJ, you want to come? He says, I'm just going to hang here. Now, come on. It'll be fun. Uh, they're going to try and get the money that uh, Victor owes them. Victor's been ducking them. They get to the party. Victor gets up. The Jasons follow him. They take him out physically. They're punk, these guys. They're punk weedos with little with their fathers, you know. Uh, AJ jumps in the car. They, they shove the kid in the car. In AJ's car. They drag him out to the woods. They beat him up. They hold him down. And then they pour sulfuric acid on between his toes. Yeah. Uh, we want to see what happened when you mix it with toe jam. He's screaming. AJ's holding him down. It's kind of tough to watch. Really tough I to watch. But AJ, yeah. AJ's kind of getting a rush out of it, it seems, in a weird way. Yeah. Tough to watch. Very strange. I never heard of anyone doing this so far, I guess. Yeah, that's pretty, pretty sadistic. Not like that. No, it's pretty sadistic. Uh, cut to the bada bing. Christopher's drunk now. He's talking about you look at your kid. They look back. It's you. I mean, he's, he's getting drunk. He's getting honest. He's talking about something that's meaningful. Uh, and they just mock him. How do I put myself up for adoption? Uh, yeah, she'll be working here in 2027. Paulie's out, uh, out of line here. He's out of line. What the fuck is he doing? He's out of line. He's being Everybody's a laughing. Even Bobby had a stripper earlier. I wonder if Bobby uh, earlier uh, had some strippers around. Bobby might, might have went nuts with the Maybe strippers. Bobby Something kind of clicked. Yeah. I went to his head. He got tired of Janice. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. They do this slow-mo shot, which is reminiscent of the scene when Tony realizes everybody's laughing at him because he's the boss. A very similar shot. And a great shot of Tony with smoke around him, almost like satanic. Christopher's taking this all in. Who the fuck are these people? Are these my friends? This guy's my uncle. Look at this. You know, yeah. they're just fucking... But, but Christopher's talking shit. Drunken shit. He's talking shit, but if they're his friends, they should have said, hey, 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 come on, let's sit down, let's yeah. have, you know. I hate uh, let's that. Get out I of hate here. that talk. I hate going out and you either a friend or a guy at the bar and he's fucking drunk and he's talking bullshit. I Philosophizing? Hate you don't like that? No. They talk religion. They talk this. They stop the bullshit. You want to talk, talk when you're sober. I hate that. Just go have a good time, a few laughs. I don't want any of that. Getting deep bullshit. Yeah. Then a metal bullshit. I don't want to hear it. You know? I hear you. They get yes, deep. They want to relax and have a good time if you're out drinking. Oh, I, want. I want to hide in the corner. I want to fucking get a little fucking half in the fucking bag and leave me a fuck alone, God damn it. Uh, is that too much to ask, Michael? No, not at all, Steve. A JT's apartment. Christopher is drunk. He comes in, knocks on the door. He says he's losing it. He's and he is. He's really kind of unraveling here. Um, he wants to make him coffee. Call the sponsor. He says the sponsor's not around. Fucking Paulie. You think he's your friend? All these pricks. I got stories. You know, he's talking about Law and Order. Uh, JT's JT seems like he's doing better. Yeah, he's got a good job. Tim's great in this scene. Uh, you know, very well written scene. 
Tim Daly, excellent. Um, said work he's the right, Lord Order. Christopher says, I got stories that'll make your head curl. Another weird, it's your toes curl or head spin. He says head curl. It's hilarious. He says, you got to work the program, go to a meeting. Christopher says, you're a robot. I'm ostracized. He means he's ostracized. My father abandoned me. He thought your father was shot. And then he says, if I wanted to, these pricks, one phone call, the whole castle comes down. Adriana, Ralph, I know shit. Gravano's living large on the government tit. I like the sun. You know, he's really, uh, I've never heard this from him. Yeah, he's, uh, he is uh, very, very uh, cocky too, JT. He's had enough. He doesn't want to hear these stories. He knows the more he knows, the the worse it is for him. And he's had enough of Christopher. Call well, again, it's like what you said before. Down. You know, listen, you know what to do. You have a problem. You're an addict. Now you're drunk. Go to your meeting. Talk to your sponsor. Work the program. You're not going to fix. What can JT fucking do here? He says, and, uh. Let me make you coffee. Christopher says it's an urban myth. Is that true? Coffee doesn't work when you're drunk? Um, I never had it. Never tried. I mean, I'm sure it can make you a little more alert. I mean, I don't know if it makes you sober, but... Um, Christopher's crying. I'm pouring my heart out to you. He's talking about ranting out. He's talking about I'm going to the program. He's saying way too much. And then... I do not want to hear this shit. Chris, you're in the mafia. Chris, he says that you're in the mafia. And it really kind of hits Christopher where he, there's some kind of realization that happens there. You know, it almost like he looks, almost like look, looking at himself in the mirror when he hears those words really affects him. And then he realizes he said too much. It was that the shooting was shot really, really well. The way they designed those shots, the way Christopher kind that of moved, walks studio, away. In the studio? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe not. I'm not sure. It's just shot really well. It kind of comes out of nowhere. Really surprising. Boom. Christopher, it, right in the forehead. Very Great realistic shot. looking. And, very realistic. Uh, yeah. And he, uh, Christopher uses the sleeve of his uh, jacket to... Uh, so there's no fingerprints. Soprano driver, Tony arrives, he has a car coming, grabs his gun, uh, and he sees AJ's pulling in. Early night, he's surprised to see AJ. They come in. Listening to Rush, the song Tom Sawyer, which is a kind of a specific choice. I don't know if it has to do with AJ and Christopher and fatherhood, no, not a father, whatever that is. It's, that's the song that's playing. Soprano they go house. inside. They're eating late at night. Midnight snack. Rachel Ray was on Leno. They got hungry. They're making pasta. Uh, you know, and uh, uh, Meadow had a mystery date. She refuses to discuss. She went to coffee with uh, had coffee with someone, and they're in a good place here. The family. AJ seems to be okay. He's teasing Meadow. Tony and Carmela smile at each other. Here's the family. It's eleven thirty at night. They're, they're having some pasta, uh, and uh, it seems to be, at the moment, all is well. Although, look at what just happened, right? All is well, but you're coming from AJ witnessing this horrible attack on somebody. But then, Tony being... Seems all is well. Rachel Ray, who I love. I've done the show many times. I'm sure you have. She's a great cook. Uh yeah, we know Rachel. She's great. We like, like Rachel, Rachel a lot. We like Rachel a lot. Uh, you know, my father used to do that once in a blue moon. I, you know, I didn't get along with him. But once in a while, I would come home late, and he would be making something good. And we would sit down and eat kind of like that. Like what, for instance, for example? Uh, you know, he would make uh, mussels with linguine and mussels, like late, you know, 11 o'clock, 11.30 at night. He would just... You know, everybody would be sleeping and he would just be making something, sauce. Or he something. was a good cook? He was a good cook, yeah. That he could do. So once in a while, I would have that, you know. I remember one time I was working uh, at Umberto's 
fish house, and uh, they gave me a couple of lobster tails to take home. You know, two or three, they gave them to me. And I brought them home, and he made them right then, you know, after work. You know, just stuck in my mind, you know, one of those things. Uh, Christopher is drunk. Again, juxtaposing these two things, the, the kind of family, the father, the son, uh, uh, cut to Christopher, drunk, alone, it's late at night. The Valley by Los Lobos is playing, which is a great song, really fits the mood. It's oh, a, a wonderful. Oh, big great, Lobos. great band. Um, and he's fixing this tree, almost like planting roots, but it's like a last ditch effort to do this and kind of a, too little, too late. You know what I mean? You know, it's amazing. Uh, you know, Christopher could just, I know he was drunk here, but just kill someone that doesn't, these guys could just kill and it doesn't mean anything. Yeah. You know? It's like, you know, the, kill someone and then go sit down and eat. No big deal. Right? Yeah, like yeah, yeah. With Ralphie, uh, he's eating peanut butter with the, with the, you know, a butter knife, you know? Exactly. No, I know. Really is fucking cold blooded, uh, you know. I think that would disturb me. I think killing someone and yeah, unless it no, was revenge. Get, revenge. They got used to it. Yeah. Uh, all right, great episode, Terry. Really, Winter. really Directed good episode. Yeah. Written by Terry Winter. Excellent now it's time job. for the Talking Sopranos. Ask me anything segment. The winner of our AMA best question is Jimmy from Lagrange. Illinois, and we're sending Jimmy a pair of Bose headphones. Jimmy asks, can you describe a typical day for you on the set? What time would you arrive? Where would you go first? Who would you talk to? What would you do? Did you have a routine that you followed? You want to go first? You want me to go first? Well, your fucking name is first everywhere else. You might as well go first. Okay. Since, since when are you uh, giving me a choice? <laughs> typical day. Well, there's no typical day, right? Every day is different. But usually if, on Monday, you'll start early in the morning because you've had the weekend. There's a thing called turnaround. So when you, when you finish work, you're supposed to have, as a union rule, 12 hours before you come back. So if you start the week... On a Monday morning, say at seven o'clock or six o'clock, you're supposed to, you might wrap eight o'clock, nine o'clock. Now you have 12 hours, so you'll come back at nine. So that gets keep, keeps getting pushed. So by Friday, you might come in late and stay really late. If you have a night scene, sometimes you'll do something called a split. Split means half day, half night. Maybe you'll come in at noon, you'll go to midnight, you'll come in at two, you'll go to two, something like that. But a typical day, maybe you'll come in at 7. I always like to have uh, coffee. I usually, my routine is usually I have coffee when I wake up and I eat at home. They have, bre they have breakfast on the set for the crew and the cast. I like to eat at home, but have another coffee when I get to set. And I like to have that coffee. I, I like to get my sides, which is that day's scenes. They're usually waiting for you in your dressing room, as is your wardrobe. I like to get the, have coffee and get my sides. I like to highlight my lines in the sides, look them over. I don't like, I hate when they like, all right, go right into make. I don't like being rushed when I get to set. And they always try to do that. They always act like there's no time for fucking everything, anything. I like to sit, drink my coffee, go over the lines. Then I like to get fully dressed in my wardrobe, then go to hair and makeup. Uh, I don't know why. That's just like the habit I got into. Um, so you'll go. Some people get dressed first. Some people don't. Then you go to hair and makeup. Then you'll get wired, which means you'll, they'll put a microphone on you. And then you'll rehearse the first scene of the day. Um, and you'll rehearse for camera. And then... You'll go and wait till they light the scene. They'll bring in the stand-ins, which are, you know, people around your height, your size, and they'll light the scene. And then you start shooting. 
And then you'll break six hours into the day, have lunch, sometimes take a nap. That's not always the best thing because you could get kind of tired. You'll have lunch on the set. So if you're on location, I like to go somewhere near in the neighborhood maybe and have lunch at a restaurant if there's time. Sometimes there's only half hour lunch. Sometimes there's an hour lunch. Sometimes you might not be in a scene in the middle of the day and you'll have a couple of hours and you might want to go take a walk, go out for lunch somewhere else. And, um, you know, and then you shoot till wrap. That's pretty much how my day would go. Steve, what about you? I uh, bring my own sides. I need big sides. Now, what about breakfast? Do you eat at home? No. I wake so up you- at least two hours or two and a half hours before they pick me up. If it's really early in the morning, like I have a six o'clock pickup, I'll get up at... Uh, you know, four thirty, five o'clock. And what do you do? I drink two cups of coffee at home. Right? That's all I do. I'll look at the newspapers online. I listen to some music, maybe. Uh, two cups of coffee. I don't have coffee when I get to the set. I have my sides already. I use big sides. I can't. So see do I. Sides. So I got to get big sides. I bring them home. I already have them circled. I don't highlight mine. I have them circled. I got my shit. I know it. Like we've talked about, I knew it the night before. I don't really even look at it in the morning. Okay? Get to set. Uh, They'll order me breakfast. I'll rehearse in street clothes. And then I'll go to hair and makeup. I'll change my shirt. Go hair and makeup. Go get dressed. I, I'd like a 10-minute warning. I don't like sitting around in the clothes. Then go down to the set. I'll have, I'll ask them for a bacon, egg, and cheese sandwich or English muffin. I'll have a Manhattan special. I have the same breakfast at home every day when I work. Same what, thing, every single day. Is that a superstitious thing? No, it's what I like to eat. What's superstitious? I like habit and routine because it... Um, when you're in, you know, listen, if you're shooting and you're in the stuff a lot, you're, you're, you're coming and going, you know, you wake up, you go to work, you come home, you might have a bite to eat and go to bed, learn your dialogue and go to bed. Well, you know, you it becomes a real <laughs> yogurt with granola and berries. And this is every day or just when you're working? I have it almost every day. It's once in a while if we'll go out and have an omelet or something like that. Usually that's what I have every day. But I like routines when I'm working because... You know, it kind of keeps things simple so you can focus on the work. Because like I said, if you're you're shooting a TV show, you're working 14 hours a day, five days a week. You know, you got to be focused. And if you know what you're going to do, you don't have to think about this or that. You have your routine. It, it grounds me. Uh, you know, I'll tell you the truth. I hate going through hair, makeup, and putting on costumes. Me too. Me too. When, when I directed the... The movie with you, Hungry Ghost, I, I directed a couple of commercials and stuff. I love coming to set and not having to do that. Yeah. Because I enjoyed being on set. Well, when I was doing Sopranos and I was a producer on set for the episode, for an episode I wrote, I loved coming to set and not having to go to hair, makeup, and wardrobe. Well, you know what? I just the, hate it. You know what's the worst is when you got to change three times in a fucking day. You got three different scenes. Uh, in three different pl- locations, three different days they take place, and you got to keep going upstairs and changing. That's a pain in yeah, the ass. Yeah, that's a pain in the ass. I hate the feeling of makeup on my face. It just, I hate, you know, I, I hate makeup. Uh, some news anchors, they walk around all day with makeup. A lot of actors will have, wear makeup. Uh, you know, you know that a lot of actors, when they're doing a red carpet, they'll have makeup before the red carpet, like at the Emmys and shit like that. Absolutely. They'll have yeah. makeup come to their house or hotel, have makeup put on, and then go because pictures are taken. Yeah, You'll never a lot see of people that. do that. You'll never see me doing that, ever. No, ever. I don't. I, I, well, when we do conversation in The Sopranos, a lot of people on stage wear makeup. Yeah, a lot. Most most of them. A lot of people that are doing the talk, they wear makeup. I hate the makeup. Uh a lot of times now on Blue Blood set, uh, they order they order me food. So I'll, they'll say, what do you want today? And I'll have 
the sandwich. This Anthony and Sons, I like their heroes, or some Chinese food, or pizza, or whatever. They'll it is. order out for lunch. Yeah, they'll order lunch for me. And I'll say, you know, get me, you know, a salad, whatever the fuck I'm in the mood for. Turkey burger, a diner, turkey burger, or fries. Order, order all the time. I don't go, uh, you know, especially now with the COVID, they have like individual. It's not like a buffet line, like, you know, you know what I mean? Oh, really? Yeah, it's not like that. So They just bring you your individual meal. Yeah. So they'll just bring me, I eat my dressing, I make some phone calls. I try not to sleep, like you said, because you get fucked up. But last week, I had an eight-hour break. Like eight hours or six hours. And I didn't want to come back home to the city because the traffic and the bullshit. I, no, also, you you know, it I takes had a lot computer, of energy. I took a nap. I uh, I talked on the phone. I caught up with phone calls, that kind of shit, you know. But that's that's what it is. I mean, you're working, you're concentrating. You know, you read the lines. I, I like I said, I need to be prepared. You know, what I will do is go over the stage direction. You know, really go over that. I know the lines. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll rehearse. First, we just read the lines. Then we'll rehearse, mark it. A lot of times, they'll also light it with the second team completely. And we just step in, you know. And then you oh. have to marry the action to the words on set too. You know where, where you're going to move, where you're going to walk, props, because you have to learn all that. You know, I couldn't, like I said, I couldn't be. Well, when I do that, I'm going to scratch my head. I'm going to do that. I'm going to fucking do this. I, you know, I, you know, I can't do it that way. It's like kind of what comes natural, you know. But that's your typical day. We would go out. We would go to Monducati's. We would go to Italian restaurant. If we had a long enough break on The Sopranos, you know, we would do that. Once in a blue moon, you want to see a scene. I would watch other guys work. You know, I used to do that. You know, if there was yeah, a- once in a while, you'll do that. Go well, some days we'd have the read through during lunch. Uh, once per episode on The Sopranos, there'd be the read through for the next episode. And we'd go up to the office and have lunch on the set. Uh, yeah. In the office, there'd be a, there'd be a, sandwiches and stuff for us there then if after like 12 hours there's something called second meal and if you're shooting like a split or a late day sometimes that could come like really late midnight two o'clock in the morning and usually they'll order that from a restaurant they'll get like pizza they'll get you know thai food or chinese food, yeah, a, lot or Mexican times, food. a lot of times you take it home because you know you wrap and there's a ton of food like a ton so you to grab a couple of chicken palm sandwiches or whatever Take yeah. a home for the road. I tell you this: almost every set that I've ever worked on are very accommodating to the actors. They want to make you feel comfortable. the The ads are professional and courteous. They yes. treat you nice. You you want something? You need something? They're there for you. Your, your pants are too tight. Your shoes are too tight. You call the wardrobe person. They're very accommodating. So, you know, that's that I, I very rarely ran into uh, a problem with that. Yeah. No, pretty much always. Always. I've always. met a lot of great people and work with a lot of great people in this business. Yeah. And I'm very yeah. grateful and lucky. So there you go. Uh, Thanks, Jimmy. Jimmy, enjoy your Bose headphones. And that's what we do all day long. Eat, 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 eat. Thanks for listening. Remember, new episodes are released every Monday. Please subscribe to the Talk of Sopranos podcast on YouTube, Apple Music, Spotify, Amazon, wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram and like us on Facebook. Right now, official Talk of Sopranos merchandise. Only got a few episodes left. Get it while you can. Because it's going to go away. Go to TalkingSopranos.com or through our YouTube channel. Our executive producers, Jeff Sussman, producers, Andy Verderam. Our music was composed and performed by Elijah Amaton. You could hear more of Elijah's music and the band Zopa, which Elijah and I play in together by clicking the links on TalkingSopranos.com. Our production crew includes Ty Verderam and Sierra Sharippa. Talking Sopranos is a pod jammed production. All right. What do we got? Four left? Not much. Not much. Four left. Wow. Wow. 
Yeah, we've done so a lot gonna of these. Are we going to have a party? Are so... we going to have a rap party, me, you, and Andy? Should we have a rap party? I think that's a good idea. Andy will get all fucking smoked up with a bong and drink and everything? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, by then <laughs> it'll be okay. That I wouldn't mind. <laughs> I'll see you next week. See you next week. <laughs>